This is Jocko Podcast number 143 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. War is never what we think it is. It is butchery, stupidity, and hate. It is 90% boredom. It can be horrible beyond anything you have ever imagined. It can also be ludicrous and absurd and technologically refined. Tragically, its lessons are always forgotten only to be refought on still another battlefield. The Vietnam War was our first real media war, spanning the globe in outraged unreality bringing videotaped death and destruction into countless homes, fermenting protests and political justifications. Affecting the world's generation, it shattered our dreams of abstract morality, and in horrible reality, re-educated our youth to a third world of suffering they had never known and had now felt deep within their own countries worldwide Vietnam was a symbol of the times the best of hopes turned inside out a fear of no return but for me and many others the Vietnam War was much more it was in a moment our survival and death in primitive sophistication our destruction and rebirth it was in short a long imprisoned cry of what we all were not this is a diary I kept while I was in Vietnam it is for the most part unstructured as many of us were but all of it is true history someone once said is trying to tell the truth through the most acceptable lie but this book is not about history it only tells the truth as far as one person felt it a frozen spark of time embracing one American soldier in a Southeast Asian war And that right there is the introduction of a book. It's, it's a diary, and it's written by a guy by the name of Peter Nash Swisher, a man that was born in Oxford, England. His dad was actually in the Second World War and was killed coming home after the war, and his mom eventually moved to Canada and then remarried to an American and Peter was adopted by that American father and grew up in Fort Atkinson Wisconsin and Louisville Kentucky that's where he grew up that's where he graduated high school and then he got his degree in American history in 1966 from Amherst College and then he got his master's from Stanford in 1967 and in 1968 he was drafted into the army he went to OCS November that same year and by 1969 he was doing his tour in Vietnam and he definitely has a gift for writing and luckily he left a little bit of that gift to be shared with us in this book of his which is called a Vietnam diary and let's go to the book he starts off with a little prologue he's got some quotes in there and I pulled out one of the quotes from the prologue it says the ultimate explanation of Vietnam must come from those involved there an observer even when blood splatters his clothes remains outside 
the basic experience of Vietnam is to be bound to stay in that war for a year or until wounded or killed. No reporter can impose this shackle on himself. He is like a doctor in an asylum. He can report with compassion and empathy. He can understand a great deal, but the final truth remains with those who must exist in madness or in the combat of their war. And that's actually a quote that he pulled from a guy named Arthur T. Hadley, who was a war correspondent. And that's very accurate. There's a huge difference between someone that's reporting the war, even though they're there, and, and you've seen the, the war reporters that are right next to the infantrymen. And sometimes they're even carrying weapons. But there's a key component. That is that those guys can leave if they want to. Mm-hmm. And those soldiers cannot. They're there. They're going to have to do their year. And that's the way it works. And that's a huge difference psychological huge difference and a, and a real difference of reality and so the the diary starts off November 20th 1967 he's going through basic training in Fort Dix New Jersey pulled a little couple a little section out of that what's the spirit of the bayonet to kill what's the spirit of the bayonet to kill sergeant H and he refers everyone here just by the, the first letter of their last name. Sergeant H was our third instructor, another airborne veteran, and one of the two survivors in his Vietnam company who came back alive. Once, when his weapon jammed in combat, he had killed two Viet Cong with his bayonet and his rifle bet. But sometimes we heard him screaming in his sleep. You see this, Poncho? You see it? Smell it. It's got the same musty odor of the jungle. Smell the fungus? Smell it. I wrapped up a lot of bodies in these ponchos, you goddamn stupid trainees. You'll see. You'll all be over there. Yeah, I mean, this is 19, 1967, so you're starting to get trained by guys that are coming back from the war. And... They're going to have a little bit of a different attitude than if they were peacetime guys. Although, this is, you know, the Korean War was shortly before this and World War II. So you have a lot of veterans in the war at this time. When I came in, when I was going through SEAL training, there was not a lot of combat veterans. Mm. There was there were some Vietnam guys, for sure. But, you know, I was going through in 1991. So most of the Vietnam guys were getting towards the end of their career. I mean, the Vietnam War for... for the teams, what is it, 72, maybe the last platoons went over there. Mm-hmm. So they were at the end of their 20-year mark. You know, some of the guys that stuck around for 30 years, yeah, sure. Roger mm-hmm. Aiden, yeah, yeah, for sure. There's some of those old Master Chiefs, absolutely. But those weren't your primary instructors. Your primary instructors were guys that had been in for five years and never seen combat. Mm-hmm. So that all changed now, of course, with the current wars going on. Back to the book, February 13th, 1969, orders. It's not very pleasant to get orders overseas the initial shock honestly scares you a lot you think maybe I'll die but later the endless reams of paperwork show you dying is not that simple take your plague flu typhus and cholera shots for example one medical sergeant is Mac the knife especially if you're on orders then there's RVN training, an M16 rifle qualification, and press orientation, and a multitude of sign-out sheets. Do you have any overdue books at the Post Library? You think, yes, I do have an overdue book. Will they still send me to Vietnam if I keep it hidden under my laundry bag? June 1st, 1969, the last night. Before the plane leaves from Travis, you are together for the last time, stoic and brave. At least that's how it is in the movies. In reality, you are sick at heart, in the mind and belly. You talk of the past pretending, but knowing what each suffers silently. It isn't very pleasant or romantic at all. Why are we such stupid people? She sobs, tears on sweat, body close. You love her fiercely. Your country is another question entirely. As usual, I am 
skipping through portions of this book to make it short enough to cover on the podcast and actually I don't even know if this book is in publication anymore I had a PDF file from back in the day and I don't even know where I got it from yeah. um, I googled it there's some PDF files floating around but get it and read the whole thing June 3rd 1969 H hour war should be dramatic like the movies sweating and landing in a craft hitting the beach under fire Who'd believe I went to war in a pink orange Braniff International airplane with a stewardess in purple leotards wishing us a good trip on behalf of the captain and the crew? Going to war for Christ's sake in a pink orange airplane, I used to think war was somewhat serious. And this is, again, this is a lot of people don't realize this. They use contract air, they still do that sometimes. Mm. And you'll fly over in a civilian plane. Mm. July 6th, 1969, airborne. Clouding dust betrays a lonely convoy, dirt smothered, embraced in jungle vines and barren hills, sullen crags and silence. A flash of light below, two more exploding lines. We see toy trucks crawling, clawing, spitting snake-like steel. Too small for life-sized war, too far away for death. So his first visions of combat, and he's looking down at it and doesn't really, It's he's admitting, he's like too far away, it's not real for him. Mm. That changes. July 17th, 1969, my first body. I saw my first body lying west of Ply Ku, stretched out on a poncho, waiting to be airlifted back to the coast. He was gray-white, and very dead. Even today I can see his gaping bloody mouth gasping for air. A young kid who couldn't have been more than 20 years old. And I thought, Christ, he's really, really dead. I remembered some James Bond and John Wayne sequels and those TV melodramas where the American love for violence is only make-believe where the movie and TV casualties can always get up and go home probably in time for supper. But this kid would not. He would make Walter Cronkite's CBS News report as just another figure. Changing 229 American battle deaths reported this week to 230 instead. And then everyone, including the president, would turn to watch the Monday night football game on Channel 5. And here was my first body. I should have been trained for this sort of thing a long time ago. Playing cops and robbers, cowboys and Indians, bang bang, you're dead. And he was. He really was. July 25th, 1969, Remembrance 2. This is how I was when I saw you last. I was stagnant, going no place, and searching desperately for something I had lost long ago in the barracks. And so we escaped to the gray New England coast and the Boston fog and a warm downy bed to greet the night. And I began to live again and laugh. I love you still for giving me that month and for giving yourself without promise. August 11th, 1969, news item. It was President Nixon's first visit to Vietnam as president. He insisted on going to Saigon rather than Cameron Bay, the huge supply base. Cameron Bay doesn't count, he said. That isn't Vietnam. Time Magazine, August 8th, 1969. Dear Sir, 
In light of a Viet Cong sapper attack on Cam Ranh Hospital, I question the source of those people who believe Cam Ranh Bay isn't Vietnam. I think the 98 men who were casualties and the parents of those who were killed would agree that Cam Ranh Bay isn't exactly Disneyland. You bastard. September 1st, 1969, Rodriguez. Jim Rodriguez was killed last week. After only 12 days in country, I remember as an upperclassman how we locked his heels together and taught him the OCS version of military discipline. It was double time, four times around the field, boonie runs, attitude checks, harassment and constant pressure. Physically and mentally, Rodriguez never broke. A matter of fact, he met our challenge one better and went on to airborne training, training briefly serving later as an airborne instructor. I wonder how much we really influenced Rodriguez. We showed him how to play soldier, but no one ever taught him how to play war. It's hard to play games with dead men. <clears throat> yeah, like I said, this 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 style of writing, this just straightforward style of writing, it's it's different. It's yeah. different. There's something there's something very guttural about it. There's something very visceral about it, and it seems. I, I mean. It seems like he's writing this with when he wrote this he had no intention whatsoever of ever sharing it with anyone That's kind yeah. of what it seems especially you know He's talking about the 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 woman that he loved back home and you can see his attitude it 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 goes kind of all over the place sometimes mm. and so there's 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 a certain level of just reality in this that I don't know it's really um, It hits in a different way than many of the books Many of the books. September 10th, 1969, Combat Engineers. Bronze backs bent to bridges, culverts, picks, and timber trestles. Sweat and grime and death by hidden mines and snipers. Construction, repair. And when will you fix my air conditioner? Ask headquarters. Again, you know, I, I know I've talked about the engineers that, that worked with us in Ramadi and what the, how how incredibly hard and dangerous that job was. Those guys were heroes. Like you couldn't even believe what these guys were doing. And this is the, just the same exact sentiment there. You know, they call I just said engineers. He says combat engineers. That's exactly right. It's combat engineers. Hundred percent. September 11th, 1969, artillery, cannon crashes eastward, magnificent, terrible thunder, bright flash, night bordered, a surging mass explodes in thunder, pageants of fire, again, again, in savage awe, we celebrate the festival of death. September 20th, 1969, a heavy load. On the way back from Queen Nan yesterday, we stopped our Jeep to help an old man with a heavy load which had fallen by the side of the road. The old man was carrying home the remains of his youngest son who had died during recent fighting along the Cambodian border. The Saigon government, he said, had provided a free coffin and transportation back to his village, but the truck had lost an axle five kilometers down the road. This wasn't his first tragedy. He told us that his eldest son had died two years older, earlier, in the assault on Way. But he never saw that son's body since he was a Viet Cong. He was an old man, he said, heartbroken and ignorant. He had lost two sons, drafted to fight on different sides of the war. And even now, he didn't really know what they had died for. 
Yeah, we hear that about the Civil War in America, that you'd have brothers fighting against brothers. Yeah. And, I mean, clearly this happened in Vietnam, but you don't think of a guy that's given up one son to each side and they're both dead. September 24th, 1969, a night. The heavens lie beyond us void, yet filled with substance, light, and form, infinity. From nothing, All exists as billions age our world not yet a grain of sand in mighty awe the universe endures mortal weak and woman born look beyond the sky some clear and cloven night by lands and meet the sea embrace the stars in infinite conceit deny from nothing all you feel and celebrate the overmind original primal force the birth of all that is October 2nd 1969 the convoy two hours before the dawn our convoy groups quietly efficiently trailers tanks and armored trucks with plated steel alert Rows of limitless, inhuman war machines assembled in Detroit from America's great arsenal of doubt. Giant tinker toys of war. The mission always comes before the welfare of the man. The all-pervading mission that no one ever knows. The men come second. Rows of tired army ants in dusty olive drab, no longer young, grim and grimy, keep their faith in faded photographs of home, a virgin hope of things to come. Or some in beads, an albatross of peace medallions hanging from their tarnished neck. A human cry in muted rage to say, at war, I am, I am. The soon forgotten symbols of a never caring world. It's time to move. A hundred muffled coughs and snarls of steel and iron trucks. The schedule must be met. We can't be late for war. The dawn is rising as we rumble past our first awaking village. Here people move to fold and field. A farmer even now to toil behind his beast and plow the sacred soil his father once endured. His desecrated tome of craters, mines, and shells across the ridge and down the dusty roads. But it will pass. It always has. The land endures all things. Very true statement. Very very true statement. Especially, I mean, you can imagine, so what did I say, 19, is this 1969 yet? No, 1969, and he's looking at these farmers, and this war is going on all around them, and guess what they're doing? They're doing what they've been doing for thousands of years. They're plowing those fields, and this war is going to come, and it's going to go, and they're still going to be there doing what they do. The soil is going to endure. The land is going to endure. October 9th, 1969, The Sporting Life. I met a Huey gunship pilot in Kui Nan who had just extended his tour of duty down in the Mekong Delta. Most pilots did the job they had to do and then went home. But not this one. He actually enjoyed his work. He bragged to a group of us one night that during a dull day where there was little action in the Delta, he kept in practice by shooting at numerous water buffalo in rice paddies and sniping at frightened farmers. In one case, he said he'd played cat and mouse with an old papasan on a bicycle, weaving frantically down the road. I scared the hell out of him for a while, he said. Then I got him good with a beautiful long burst. No chance. Hell, he was in a free fire zone. Probably VC anyways. All the slopes down there are VC. We looked at him incredulously and then left his table, leaving him alone, gloating to himself. Even at war, he remained a leper within some strange, unwritten code. October 
October 10th, 1969. Howell Beach at night. I wish you were here right now so I could hold you very close and tell you things there are no words for. October 14th, 1969. Home one. We cling to something close at home, a girl or shadow on the wall, free sun, a ragged hope so precious in return. If lost, we too are lost. Not finding hate, as soldiers seldom hate, but bitter, stale, in passion, dead. We lose our need to love. Home too. I love you as gentle dawn spread out against the savage sky, a part of life so very far away. Yeah, it's um, again important to point out, as I always try to, that these men that went to war were not just soldiers and not just marines and not just sailors not just airmen but they were they were men with hopes and dreams they were men in love with that girl back home and they couldn't stop thinking about her october 23rd 1969 may i was talking to may today a pretty vietnamese girl who works in headquarters detachment as a secretary. May speaks English very well, and often we joke and talk about a lot of trivial things, but today the conversation was more serious. What would happen, I asked her, if the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese take over the South one day? May's face remained impassive. I work for the Americans, so they would shoot me. Then they would kill my family. And that is the reality. And that's the reality that, you know, when ISIS came into Ramadi after we had left, about seven years after we had left, and after Ramadi had been peaceful for about seven years, and, and ISIS came in and took it over, it's so one of the first things that they did was they, anyone that they knew had worked with coalition forces at all, they got murdered, and their families got murdered. And from what I, the, the information that I received from my contacts over there was about 500 families yeah. were murdered. All of them. So yeah, when, if you're going to go into a country and you're going to work there and you're going to support some of the people, make sure you stay there until the job is done. November 2nd, 1969, Slopes and Dinks. He was a young buck sergeant from Alabama, proud of his artillery days at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and proud to defend America from worldwide communist aggression. The Vietnamese communists, in his eyes, were subhumans. Anyway, slopes and dinks who felt no human emotion and therefore who could be eradicated as swiftly as possible without regret. He saw this enemy, he told me, for the first time during the Tet Offensive of 1969 when, for days and nights on end, his battery kept mowing down human wave enemy assaults by lowering the howitzers to tree trunk level and firing bumblebee canisters which sprayed thousands of anti-personnel darts into the enemy troops. But still they kept on coming. One wave after another. On the night after the last attack, he went out with a small patrol to survey the damage and found hundreds and thousands of the enemy dead. But he also found frightened young boys and young men who had died clutching one another in terror or who had died trying to bandage each other's wounds. And the young sergeant told me that he knew then that they must also have mothers, sisters, and wives at home just like his men, and that they had been terrified during the battle just like his men. 
and that they bled and felt pain and cried just like his men and he never called them slopes or dinks ever again November 21st, 1969, Sydney, Australia. After six months at war, a 10-day miracle. A beautiful, heavenly city on the bay, the frontier spirit with a wry sense of Aussie humor, drinking a schooner of swan lager with new friends, invited everywhere, a genuine Australian openness, upfront and honest. The bay and the opera house, Bondi Beach, riding the waves, the restaurants and nightlife, incredibly beautiful, tall Australian girls, disarming and very real. Not afraid to be themselves, to disagree, outgoing and direct, deep and beautiful, like their city. Sydney, Australia, the reality of heaven, treating us as people again and true friends, making us feel more at home than home itself. Our last night was spent in a seafood restaurant. Mrs. Murphy, the restaurant older, told us, if you'd come earlier, boys, we'd have had some fine dates for you tonight. Unfortunately, no wine was sold after 9 p.m. with dinner. An older couple approached our table. Here, boys, take our bottle. Your fathers really helped us during the last war, and we know how you feel about this one. God bless you and take care, boys. Take care. Sydney, Australia. A beautiful, lasting friendship. A love affair with life that, back in Vietnam, had all too soon the unfamiliar face that precious things take on when our heart is left behind. Yeah, I can't even, I've been to Australia and it's awesome and I can't even imagine what it would be like going from the Vietnam War into Australia for 10 days of leave Mm. and to have the Australian people just be awesome. So, to the Aussies out there. Thanks for the support. December 19th, 1969, incoming. A dull thud, muffled close, growing fearful, thud. Followed twice, another crash, Christ, body, feet, flailing, hands in sweat, waiting, waiting, crash. God, oh Jesus, crash. Receding thud, waiting. Still waiting, not you, thank God. Move your head, not you. Move your arm, not this time. <laughs> so there you go, that's incoming. That's, that's, that's waiting for, that's when you, hear, when you hear it get launched and you know it's coming, that's what it is. When he's saying not you, that's like he's checking, dang, is that, yep. move your head, hit. nope, yeah. not you. Move your arm, not this time, we're yeah. good. <laughs> Yeah. January 22nd, 1970, dispatch at 19, 11, 45 hours, 10 kilometers northwest of Hoi Nan, a 16-year-old youth from a nearby hamlet entered Than Quit Hamlet and threw two fragmentation grenades into a group of children and Marines of the USMC Combined Civic Action Platoon 237. There were four friendly killed in action, Vietnamese children, and 15 wounded in action, 11 Vietnamese children, and four United States Marine Corps. The youth who threw the grenades escaped. That's just, I mean, just that snapshot of what you're dealing with. There you are in a civic action platoon out there trying to help out, and a 16-year-old kid comes and hucks two grenades and wounds 11 of the little kids you're trying to help and four of your men and that's what your life is February 4th 1970 small and pleading eyes our combat medic with all his tubes and bottles could never heal that gaping wound nor still your fearful cry Jesus, 
God, what a petty, callous war when armies clash in hate to disembowel a child. February 15th, 1970, a Green Beret in Na Trang. One can never generalize about individual divisions, regiments, or any particular unit. It's hard enough generalizing about particular people. But in Na Trang, I did meet a Green Beret who, as one individual, was at least honest about his motivation. I was sharing his battle of Jack Daniels and ice. I joined the Green Berets for excitement, I guess. On one hand, we're living with the yards, raising crops, growing pigs, and hunting Charlie. On the other hand, you kill and drink, smoke and whore. Every minute may be your last, you know what I mean? Man, if I were back in the States doing this sort of thing, I'd either be dead or sitting on death row by now. But over here, we've got a free license, you know what I mean? He said he was thinking of settling down after the war, getting into a business trainee program when he got back to the States, or maybe into some branch of law enforcement. Yeah, war is suited to some people, for sure. March 1st, 1970, interlude. I saw a movie tonight that made me think of you. It's bad, thinking, you know. Yesterday I thought of Lee who was killed last month in one core. The movie was one of the few we saw together last year. How different seeing it again, alone, sitting in the sand, at war. It made me think of our own interlude. Why we could never accept less than we had and would never have again. I don't know if you want to think about that sentence too much. It's a little bit heavy. Why we could never accept less than we had and would never have again. March 4th, Remembrance 3. When you smiled at me, I knew you were different. You had no snide remark for my uniform or ununtered a look of mock pity which seemed to say, look everybody, it's one of them again. And you didn't approach me with a fashionable overriding concern or preach to me from a preassembled dreadnought of morality. No, and you didn't stare away from me or at me or through me. All you said was hello. But through that one simple word, I was no longer alone. Observation, flower petal, pushing through the crusted earth, embraces light and dies. The ugly root endures, but never blooms. March 14th, 1970, the provost marshal. Jeep stealing in Vietnam was a national pastime. The Vietnamese nationals had acquired chain cutters and became very adept at Western auto mechanics with special emphasis in jump-starting the engines and removing all serial or identification markings with lightning speed. Even the shorebound Navy installations took great delight in their midnight requisitions of Army material. And the Green Berets from Nha Trang had on one occasion brought in a CH-47 sling helicopter and airlifted away a brand new vehicle that was apparently impossible to obtain through ordinary supply channels. (laughs) Yes. The new Provost Marshal at Cameron Bay decided to do something about these thefts and implemented a stern directive from the military police to all personnel who had their vehicles stolen. They would now have to write an extensive report in triplicate to the provost marshal explaining the surrounding circumstances and further appear before a board of inquiry, remaining liable to possible Article 15 or court martial proceedings for negligently allowing these thefts to occur. These orders were to, have take, fast, to take effect by the provost marshal's directive on March 11th. That would really take care of the problem, the provost marshal promised the general, by the sternest measures and prompt prosecution of any 
negligent offenders. On the morning of March 13th, the provost marshal was seen walking to work. Someone had stolen his Jeep. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Good little story. There's that stuff definitely happens. My CBs were quite good at that. So what? in Task Unit Bruiser, we had CBs, the, the, the construction battalion, their Navy guys that do construction, but they also have combat skills. So their, their motto is we build, we fight. Mm. And they should have another motto that's like, we get things if you need them. <laughs> <laughs> so my guys were awesome at that. And they were also awesome at everything else they did. But it was nice that when I needed something, they would find a way to acquire it. Mm-hmm. Thanks there to you, Bruiser CBs. All right. March 15th, 1970, graffiti. And he's just got a list of graffiti here. Um, Lifer. 986 days in a wake up. Next, before I came in the army, and this is all misspelled, before I came in the army, I couldn't spell engineer. Now nah, our one. <laughs> Here's a good one. The U.S. Army, 184 years of tradition, unhampered by progress. <laughs> the army's like a rubber. It gives you that false sense of security while you're getting screwed. It's not a real war yet. We're just 550,000 military advisors. <laughs> Fighting for peace is like screwing for chastity. Share in the fright with freedom. Go home with a friend. Next, give me your hearts and minds and I'll burn your fucking hut. <laughs> Next, war is hell. But a year without a woman is a real bitch. Next, how come we can get to the moon, but I can't get home? Next, those personnel with short stacks and low manifold pressure, please taxi closer to the urinal. (laughs) Next, Yesarian Lives, that's a little shout out to Catch-22, the book. Next, would the last American soldier leaving Vietnam please turn out the light at the end of the tunnel? I think that's in reference to the fact that the higher ups kept saying that they could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Hey, you know, we're coming, we're getting there. Yeah, They're yeah. starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. March 19th, 1970, Love, L U V. We once had a little puppy called Love. She was the company mascot and dug just about everyone. She was one of those beautiful little creatures who hadn't ever learned to hate or fear. She trusted everyone. Love trusted the sergeant, too, even though the sergeant wanted her wasted as a damn nuisance. So Love never came home with us. But neither did the sergeant. Better halves. Truck convoys and mechanized patrols often wed many men to their vehicles during most of their Vietnam tour. The names of such better halves included... Here, so this is just the names of a bunch of different vehicles. Battlin' Bob, Psychedelic Flower, Old Faithful, Road Runner, Acid Rock, Hell for Certain, Puzzle Palace, Pusher Man, Grim Reaper, Iron Butterfly, Grass Bender, Artful Dodger, Moratorium, and Malfunction Junction. <laughs> and uh, my first deployment to Iraq are... Our, you you might appreciate this. Yeah, I think I've said this before, but our vehicles, my first deployment, were named after... After the movie Kingpin, mm-hmm. so Big Earn, <laughs> Big Earn was one of them for sure. Yeah, that was all of them. Yeah. And then yeah. Leif, I think it was primarily Leif's idea. He he wanted to name and did name. They named all the vehicles after GI Joe characters like Cobra Commander and stuff like huh? that. Cobra Commander. So there you go. Get some. Oh, you know it's. It's one of those things like like is that just always gonna happen? Uh, that's what I was thinking. In 300 years if you have a war and there's some kind of vehicle Do you just name them yeah. whatever kind of cool names you can give them? I think yeah. it's because it's a little point of control that you have even as a, as a frontline guy Yeah, like that you can do and it's cool. Yeah, it's like kind of you little gives your war a little character Yeah, like it's a little fun thing you can add like you know how the patches yeah. situation or, or you know just all that stuff 
or Seal House BTF, you know, kind of yeah. thing. It's like to <laughs> to kind of deviate from the war, yeah, almost in in your own like little group. Just, it allows us for a little creativity. A little creativity, <laughs> yes, yes. It's funny because well, naming vehicles was good, and I I remember so they we used to number the vehicles one two three four five six seven or one two three four five six or whatever one two three four five. There's a problem with it though, because the the vehicles aren't always where they're supposed to be when right. you get, chronologically. Yeah, right. so you'd yeah. go, oh wait a second. So you'd go out and get in the number third vehicle, right. which was number three, but you weren't supposed to be in that vehicle. It's number three vehicle is number six in position right now because yeah. they got scrambled up while yeah. they were maneuvering. Yeah. So that's why we ended up. I, I told the guys name the vehicles, no numbers. Yeah. That's what they did. Named them, and they named them after Kingpin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I think there might be a picture of there. There's definitely some pictures of. Uh, of my first deployment in the dichotomy of in the dichotomy of leadership book, but I want to see if you can see any of the vehicle names yeah. written on the side. Zev was one of the ones that I saw. Big Zev. Yeah, not in the book, but yeah, in one of the pictures that's, they sent me. That's yeah, that's from that's from Ramadi. That was Big Zev. I think that was actually our big giant war pit. I I, I always like there was a I think it was the Marine Corps had a big six by truck. That was, they had War Pig. That was a War Pig. I always liked that one. I mean, that's kind of a given that you're going to have it. No, there's no names on that vehicle. Check. Amen. Next, March 20th, 1970, The Two Fronts. The kid was caught, caught out in the open by a stray mortar round. They don't make coffee the way they used to, the businessman said. And those kids with long hair? Jesus. The impact cut off his arm, the lower half of his right leg, and blew off half his head, oozing red-black blood into the sand. He was 19 years old and from Ohio. Well, the president must know what he's doing. He has my full support. Where the hell is the waitress? The kid only had two weeks left in Vietnam. Three days before, he'd already framed a copy of his orders home. April 2nd, 1970, a bond of friendship. It was hot. The ambush had been effective. Out there in the brush, there was little protection from sight or hail of gunfire. The soldier caught sight of his buddy, seriously wounded. Sir, please, let me get him. Please. The officer, well aware of their deep friendship, hesitated and then said, Go, but it's not worth it. Your friend is probably dead, and you may get killed trying. But the soldier went. Miraculously, he hoisted his friend onto his shoulders, and under heavy fire, the two of them stumbled back into the trench. The officer looked tenderly at the would-be rescuer. I told you it wouldn't be worth it. Your buddy is dead, and you are badly wounded. I know, sir, the soldier replied, but you're wrong. It was worth it. Because just before he died, he looked at me and said, I knew you'd come. It didn't matter that day that one man was white and the other black. Thank you, God, that out of a hellish war, we can still learn the meaning of true brotherhood. Chaplain Donald J. Robinson from the 101st Airborne Division. That's where he took that story from. When you were kind of g g jumping back and forth to like, oh, coffee isn't made yeah. with these two, is that, was he like just he had, comparing? He had, what, what I should have described a little bit better. He had one set of the, the stuff that was taking place in the civilian world back in the States, he had in parentheses. Yeah. So while this kid is getting ripped right. apart by a mortar round, back in American parentheses, it just says, um, you know, oh, hey, where's the waitress? Yeah, like and, and, and you can imagine how, you know, that's why, you know, I think even during World War II, we, during World War II, the guys were over fighting, but at home, like everyone was focused on the war effort. Yeah. And they were rationing and they were building. I mean, they changed factories to start building planes instead of like civilian cars. They built war planes and they built yeah. bombs and they built ammunition, they built guns. Like the whole country was focused on it. In mm -hmm. Vietnam, that wasn't really happening. You mm -hmm. know, it wasn't really that same situation. If you got drafted, your whole world freaking went upside down. But if you didn't get drafted, you were going to live your normal life and go work your job and live normal and go to the restaurant and ask where the hell the waitress is. Yeah. 
That's similar to what it's like now. I mean, actually, that is what it's like now. And I've talked about that a bunch of times. Talked about it with Sam Harris. You know, like yeah. we, it, the the war, the wars that we have right now. There's a vast majority of the population of America. It doesn't affect them at all. It literally doesn't affect them at all. Yeah. Because yeah, it has had no impact on the the food that you eat, the gas that you use, zero impact. The even the way you travel, like okay, you could say, well, you know, we used to be able to. And I don't know how much you traveled before nine eleven. I traveled a lot before nine eleven, and you you know, it was a lot easier to travel. It was a lot quicker, and there was the flights always seemed to be happening. It was just an easier deal. Yeah. But now TSA is dialed in enough when you get used to the program and you whatever. It's not that big of a deal. It's not like your freaking life is it's yeah. not a big deal. Yeah. So really, the wars that we're going through right now for people that are detached from them. So, I mean, obviously, you got military and you got the families of the military. Yeah, sure. sure. But once you step outside, you know, you step one or two degrees away from that, you could be living your life. And if you didn't see it on the news, you would never, ever know that there was a war going on. Yeah. And that's... And what from and I think the reason he wrote that was because that's talking about now from the perspective of like when you're in the war You're thinking about those people that are, they, they're not even this not even affecting them yep. Occasionally they watch the news and go. Oh, there was someone else killed. Okay. Can I get can you pass the mayonnaise? Yeah, and even how like if you're not engaged in it It's like, you know, just how you say when you only when you're watching the news That's when you see it and even now like when you watch the news you're like oh wow you know that's that's too bad that that's happening literally the moment the news goes off and i'm not talking about the war stuff i'm talking about everything on yeah. the news really cuz you know i don't know a car accident or well, something well the news good cycle's getting so ridiculous right now oh, yeah, the news no. cycle's completely ridiculous right now yeah. and and it's no big surprise that why people listen to this podcast why people are listening to all podcasts why people are watching YouTube videos that are two and three and four hours long yeah. Why is that because they want to have a little bit more depth to what they're hearing? I was on the airplane. I got done. You know, they make you put away your computer and so I turned on the news because it had streaming cable news yeah. and I turn it on and I mean I'm going when do they turn on when do they make you put away your computer 20 minutes I had 20 minutes left Mm-hmm. And in that 20 minutes, there was like three se- or two sections of commercials. Actually, there might have been three sections of commercials that are all like four minutes long. Mm-hmm. I was getting so mad. I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, bro, I just want to know what's happening. And you got to show me another commercial yeah. about some mattress company just or what. I mean, just just, me just, just trying to sell me stuff. And then it goes back to the coverage, right? <laughs> It goes back sure. to the coverage, yeah. and the coverage is people yelling at each other. There's yeah. no conversations happening. Yeah. It's it's It's... And I've done, you know, I've done plenty of news uh, bits, bites, whatever it's called. Yeah. And you compared to a podcast, yeah. it's a joke. Yeah, it's, it's like a joke. It's that's literally why we, nothing. That's why. Know? That's why you know Elon Musk going on to Joe Rogan and talking for three hours. You know, that's yeah. a whole different story. Yeah. That's a whole different thing. Yeah. And I, you know, I th- kind of think that's the beginning. That's yeah. the, that's sort of, uh, it's the beginning of the end. <laughs> End of some stuff. Yeah, yeah the end of some sure. stuff and the starting yeah. of some other stuff. But that when you when you just can s- s- turn on the news and it's and it's over that quickly, yeah. and it doesn't bring you anything other than literally the headline. Yeah, it's just the headline, which a lot of times is misleading on purpose. Which is too. yeah, which is is clickbait often. Yeah, right. It's clickbait. Yeah. Is and your cell phone killing you? They're not saying the cell your cell phone is killing <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, but is, is, is it? it? Kind of yeah. thing. Bro, I don't. Yeah, but now I got to know and I got to click on that exactly thing. Exactly right. Yeah. So nowadays, that's even. I, it could, you could say that's probably even worse because there's so many. And plus, not to mention back then, if you were going to watch, you know, my dad was telling me this the other day that back in the back in the day, they they had a. You know, everyone watched, like he just mentioned, he mentioned Walter Cronkite in this. And mm-hmm. like my dad was like, yeah, everyone watched Walter Cronkite. So everyone had a base common theme of discussion. So yeah. when you went to work on Thursday, everyone had watched the news on Wednesday and yeah. everyone saw the same news. Yeah. And nowadays, so if you wanted to watch TV, you were going to watch that. Yeah. I mean, I remember Walter Cronkite. Yeah. You know, that's that was my dad. W- w- that's what was on night. You watched Walter Cronkite. That was just that was just how. That was just how. And now you can go home and never watch the news. So you can be completely. You know, not only. You know, it's one thing to say, "Hey, the news is over about the war in thirty seconds," and I don't think about it anymore. You can just never even watch it. You can yeah. just watch Instagram videos of car crashes yeah. or, or. 
what other dumb stuff do you watch on uh, on Instagram? Drunk girl fails. Drunk girl fails. Yeah, mm-hmm. let's watch thirty. Well, I've got you know an extra half an hour. I'll watch t- a half an hour worth of drunk girls fails, <laughs> and they're and they're funny and they're yep. entertaining mm-hmm. and they. What part of the mind do they stimulate? Because they must stimulate some part of your brain. Yeah. Because they so. when you watch car crashes. Yeah. You know, and now I was gonna throw street fights in there, but when I watch street fights, I'm actually picking Learning. them apart, right? Yeah. I'm actually trying to learn something. Yeah. And, but you know, drunk girls, fa- drunk girl fellas, those you don't learn a lot from. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I've <laughs> shown my daughters drunk girl fails, like when they were yeah. 13, 14 years old, mm-hmm. and be like, oh, this is what alcohol will get you. Yeah. And and the other thing, for a while they were showing binge drinking in England. Oh uh, yeah, and you know it was. I was actually in the news a little bit, and it would just be you know men and women. But I'd show my daughters the women of mm. just girls, just completely passed out, drunk, skirt hanging open. I mean, just yeah. puke all over themselves. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, "Hey, this is drinking. This is alcohol. This is this is what your little friends are getting all excited about and think is so cool. Yeah. This is it. <laughs> this yeah. is what it gets you. <laughs> puke." Yeah. So yeah, good, good tool. So you can totally avoid. You can basically customize your information flow into your brain to whatever you want. Yeah. And I'll go one step further and tell you that the algorithms that YouTube is putting ahead of you, in front of you. So when you get done watching one YouTube video of a drunk girl fail, what pops up? Nine more drunk Another girl one. fails yep. that they are ready watch. for you to watch. Yep. So they've got an algorithm that's actually going to just lead you to stupidity. Yeah. Right? They should put, instead of putting advertisements, they should be like, okay, for every four really dumb YouTube video you watch, you should have to watch at least one quarter of that compiled time into something that's going to teach you something about being a better human being. Yeah. You know, I don't know how good of a business model that would be, but you know, I, it's it's a good idea, kind of in theory, I guess. You got to get beyond just thinking about money, Echo Charles. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I dig it, man. I dig it. I'm not saying they shouldn't. I'm just saying uh, that's why they won't. But yeah, well, yeah, so, yeah. It's like right now, because right now in this, in the, they're trying to put these limits on time, or I think the social media people are saying. Hey, we're gonna help you monitor your time that you spend on social media. So there'll be like a little thing that pops into you. You've spent forty minutes on yeah. social media today, right. yeah. Because you're right. You know what they're not gonna say? You reached your limit. You're done. Yeah. They're not gonna no, say that. No, they're no. not. And they're not yeah. gonna say, "Hey, you watched nine stupid videos. Now you gotta watch three educational ones that make you smarter." <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, they're going to show you the time of your um, consumption mm-hmm. right next to the next video that they that they made formulated yeah. on yeah, what yeah, you yeah, like yeah, to yeah, watch. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. the be like, thing oh, that's completely you know? irresistible to you. Yeah, that's what they're the going to do. The thing that you got to watch: a drunk girl failing. You can see <laughs> her, and she's like standing on the edge of whatever, <laughs> yeah, and you yeah, know yeah, it's yeah. going to be a good one. Well, yeah, yeah, traced in like red <laughs> with exclamation <laughs> mark. You know, or point. You know how they do that, yeah. where it's like, oh, it's so exciting. Yeah, yeah, so exciting. I see what you're doing. But yeah, so you can be completely, the point there is you can be completely disconnected, especially now, completely disconnected with the reality of the world. All right, April 4th, 1970, Colonel S. Many officers and NCOs in Vietnam know their business. Even though they hate the war, a war not of their own making, they really take care of their men and don't give a damn about frontline formalities. All they want is to get as many of their men back alive as they can. The men deeply respect these officers and NCOs and justifiably so. So there you go. A little bit, little bit of leadership here. Taking care of your men. Other, back to the book. Other officers are little people with rank and authority and little else. They cannot command respect by their actions, so they must command by their disrespect verbally and for petty offenses, for haircuts, polished boots, and frontline salutes. Colonel S. was one of these men, a little puffy hamster man who would not hesitate to lick the general's boots on any occasion. And he had the audacity on numerous occasions to lambast various troops for their sloppy haircuts and uniforms at the base PX. Such troops had just come in from the field or from a long, exhausting convoy and had not seen the likes of a shower, much less a barber, in a number of weeks. They always looked at the colonel in total disbelief. And then, comprehending 
in a long imprisoned rage for this antiseptic staff toady. Colonel S's written directives were likewise incomprehensible, unnecessary, wasteful, and in a word, unbelievably stupid. Many of us thought that Joseph Heller's Catch-22 was an unreal parody about war until we met Colonel S. One night, some Viet Cong sappers blew up our petroleum storage dump, and it was incredible. It was an incredible blaze for three days and nights. Anyway, after the immediate attack, Colonel S jumped out of his jeep, grabbed his forty-five caliber pistol, and went chasing after the VC, hell bent for hell bent for musty leather, stumbling over the sand dunes like a long retired prop man in a John Wayne war movie, attempting a futile and embarrassing comeback. We all sort of hoped that the Viet Cong would follow the logical rules of guerrilla warfare and leave one sniper back to cover their escape, waiting for the much beloved staff colonel to come panting over the hill. But no such luck. Apparently the VC knew all about the colonel and wanted to leave him right where he was and who could blame them. (laughs) So there you go, there's those type of people, they exist now. They're going to exist in the future. If you're one of those people that started listening to the podcast and joined the military, and I know there's a lot of you, get some. That's awesome. Um, when you, don't don't think that every officer you meet is going to be one of these guys that takes care of their men and doesn't give a damn about frontline formalities and is deeply respected. That's that's not a majority. Mm. Now this other knucklehead, the guy that's licking the boots of the general, that's not a majority either. But they exist. They're there. April 9th, 1970. Waiting. Waiting is 90% of the game in Vietnam. You keep busy. You do your job 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Occasionally there's a half day off, a stand down, or 10 days of R&R outside of Vietnam. But the rest of the time, you wait. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Until things happen, you wait. And then when it happens, you're right in the middle of it. When you're not working or sleeping, you're still waiting. And time can play some horrible tricks on you. Vietnam may be a one-year tour for most soldiers, but they have actually spent many more years there than they care to talk about. Time in Vietnam slows down almost to a stop every minute of every day. The Vietnamese have lived with this phenomenon for century, but the Western soldier cannot. Your last two weeks in Vietnam, like your first two weeks, are measured in months, and you're especially paranoid about getting hit during these last two weeks, and you wait. Your off-duty time is short-lived and very precious. With a 24-hour day and a a seven-a-day-a-week, it is the only time you have to blow off your stress and anxiety, your loneliness, fear, and frustration. Sometimes you can almost, but only almost, forget the war. During this time, we grew together with our friends. We shared each other's hurt and pain, our love and hate for home and war. We got to know each other in a very deep sense, maybe better than our wives or girlfriends ever would. We talked philosophy and we talked nonsense. We laughed and we cried. We learned to live and grow. We looked back and we looked ahead. We talked about changes in us and in America. We committed ourselves to both. Without these friends, Vietnam would have been much worse than it already was. Our friends made this waiting bearable. April 11th, 1970, Medicine Men. Many doctors assigned to the medical corps in Vietnam devote much of their very limited and precious off-time duty working with Vietnamese civilians. Most medical assistance from the other side is gratefully appreciated, but there are exceptions. My brother Charles, who was assigned to the 6th Convalescent Center in Southern Tu Corps, worked with the many Vietnamese civilians in Cam Ranh Village and Mai Ka village among others but three weeks after he ended his tour of duty in vietnam a small group of Viet Cong sappers blew up his hospital killing and wounding 98 bedridden patients 
another army doctor working in a small village not far from Cameron Bay, successfully saved the life of a young girl, 12 years old, who had both of her hands blown off by a grenade. The little girl's grandmother was also injured in the blast. A short while later, the doctor learned that the young girl's injuries occurred while she and her grandmother had been attempting to booby trap the doctor's own Jeep with this same grenade, hoping to kill him when he started his engine. A third unarmed American medic spent much of his free time in a similar village attempting to fight an outbreak of cholera and typhoid. One young Vietnamese boy was too sick to be saved when the medic arrived in the village, but rumors circulated throughout the hamlet that the American medic was responsible for killing the boy with his poisonous medicine. Consequently, the village allowed two Viet Cong snipers to ambush and kill the young medic when he drove back into the village a few days later with another shipment of life-saving drugs. Few medical personnel dared to enter this village after the episode, and half the villagers later died as a result of cholera epidemic. <sighs> yeah. This is... You know, I was reading... Uh, last night I was actually reading um, an interview with David Hackworth that I've read it before, but I was reading it again. And one of the things he said was that the goal, because we dropped, he was going through the numbers, and I'll we'll do this, we'll do this interview on the podcast. I'll bring it in, and but he was saying he was talking about how much bombs we dropped on Vietnam. So Vietnam's about the size of California, mm-hmm. and we dropped more bombs in Vietnam than got dropped in all of Europe during World War II on both sides. So both the Allies and the Axis, all bombs put together during all of World War II, in all that area, there was more dropped into just Vietnam. And what what someone said was, you know, he's quoting a general that said, hey, we're going to bomb them back into the Stone Age. Mm -hmm. And what he didn't realize is that they were already were in the Stone Age. These people are living, they're farmers, they're they're working, they're basically in the Stone Age. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the, my point is that they're not going to understand this medical treatment. And if someone comes in and starts manipulating their brains and saying, "Oh, that that your that kid was killed by this poisonous medicine," mm. April fifteenth, nineteen seventy, a short short story. Once upon a time, there was a politician who all by himself, blustered and stormed and committed half a million young men to risk their lives in war. Some fat-assed, power-hungry politician who in all his potato-face ugliness had the gall to consider himself a statesman and a man of decision. The American sheep went bah, bah, and the young boys died, and Bulbnose lived happily ever after. Kirkmeyer, Lee, Cothran, Daly, Rodriguez, just names, just figures. April 19th, 1970, officers and men. American soldiers in Vietnam came from all walks of life, and so did the officers. Most of the officers I worked with in Vietnam, in Saigon, Cam Ranh, Nha Trang, were citizen soldiers like I was, graduates of ROTC or OCS. Only Colonel S, Major T, and Captain D were West Point graduates. Colonel S is discussed elsewhere in this book. Book. Captain D didn't like going along with anyone, and Major T was a good officer, well liked, and much respected. One out of three ain't bad. For six months, my superior officer was Major P from the 173rd Airborne, and I couldn't have worked for a better man in or out of the Army. He treated us all like human beings, no matter what our rank was, and we were all fiercely loyal in return. Hey, there's a novel idea. 
That's a novel idea. All these people that ask me, like, oh, I'm t- taking over a leadership position. What should I do? Here's step one. Treat your people like human beings no matter what their rank are. And look, he says that people were fiercely loyal in return. Mm-hmm. When Major P left, however, we became expendable to the greater glories of someone else. The army, like any civilian counterpart, has its equal share of the good, the bad, and the ugly. One of my closest friends in Vietnam was none of the above. He was a stevedore officer, a Pentecostal minister's son, and Zorba the Greek. He treated his men as individuals, rankless and unique. They did their job with a minimum of hassle, and they loved him. He was their counselor, their friend, and their equal. When he was about to leave Vietnam, his men gave him a symbolic christening in beer and threw him in the ocean. He told them to treat each other just like you'd want the other dude to treat you. The golden rule in a tub full of beer. An inner light forever branching outward. In Vietnam, when most of us were plodding through the absurd, inhuman procedures of the war, he alone remained a man of substance. So again, it's like treat your people well. April 27th, 1970, a highway accident. Yesterday, we saw the results of what happens when a small Lambretta scooter bus filled with 12 Vietnamese civilians hits a Viet Cong mine buried along the side of a main highway. The mine was primarily an anti-personnel device used as the military abstractly explains it, the harass the civilian population. There were a lot of mangled bodies lying there until they were policed up, primarily older people, women, and children. The elder sons and husbands had already been conscripted to take their chances on the conventional battlefield. In America, a big highway accident or related disaster usually draws a huge, morbid crowd to stare and gawk. Yesterday, in Vietnam, no one seemed to notice. April 30th, 1970, the Koreans... The Koreans fielded in excess of two crack divisions during the Vietnam War. The ROC, that's Republic of Korea, the ROC troops were greatly feared and respected by the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese alike. They asked for and gave little quarter to the communists. Once, when one of their troops was ambushed outside a small village in northern Tukor, the Koreans hunted the sniper down, brought him back to the village, strung him up on a tree, and skinned him alive. The Koreans' bravery, devotion, and ferocity as a fighting force was legendary in Vietnam. During the Tet Offensive of 1968, every major Allied headquarters and military compound in all of Vietnam was attacked by the Communists except one. The VC and the North Vietnamese gave wide berth to the Koreans. I did not know that, but that's, <laughs> that's legit. <laughs> they said, uh, yeah, we're not going to attack the Korean compound. I'm going to leave it alone. Yeah. So there is uh, that speaks volumes. Mm-hmm. That speaks volumes. That's why <sighs> yeah, you got to carry a big stick. <laughs> got to carry a big stick. Props to the Koreans. Here's a little poem. In memory of a friend killed in action. Is it weakness? For a strong man to be moved by inner touch. Must he spurn a lonely blade of grass and damn the ocean's roar? Or must he look at sentimental beauty as a crutch and choose to play the game of pride by calling life a whore? No. I have seen the strongest man defend a withered rose and fall from grace because the people didn't understand. They thought it was his weakness they exploited, I suppose, 
and killing him in ignorance they trembled in his hand May 25th 1970 Kent State in the futility and rage over President Nixon's Cambodian invasion the killing of four student demonstrators at Kent State University by the Ohio National Guard mystified many GIs in Vietnam we felt this outrage too but we had a hard time comprehending how the press and the nation could make so much of an issue out of these four student deaths when we were losing friends and comrades and an average of 250 men killed each and every week it made us feel as unwilling participants that we were a subhuman species neglected and alone forgotten pawns in a confused and godforsaken war and we were on both sides of the ocean yeah I mean obviously growing up you 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 actually study like when I went to history class in high school like we specifically learned about the Kent State massacre which obviously is horrible but can you imagine so for these students get killed these student protesters obviously never should have happened but can you imagine being in Vietnam and the whole country of America is up in arms about these four students being killed but every week there's 250 of your friends getting killed May 26, 1970, the real heroes. The medics and medevac personnel in Vietnam, almost to a man, were beautiful and very dedicated people, braving the fiercest fire and most harrowing odds to comfort and evacuate the wounded and dying, military and civilian alike, often from both sides, from the heat of battle. In any war, the real heroes are those who try to maintain basic humanity, time and time again risking their own lives so that others might live. In Vietnam, the medics and medevac people were such men. May 28, 1970, anti-war protesters. There were various reactions by Vietnam GIs to the anti-war protesters back home. The bulk of the infantry were high school graduates who knew that college deferments kept most of the more affluent anti-war protesters out of the draft and thus out of the war. To these GIs, Vietnam was viewed in terms of a deep deep gut reaction, a sort of misery loves company affair. I wish those goddamn protesters could be over here for one week and see what the VC did to my buddy. It changed their goddamn minds real quick. That was, he had that in quotes. That wasn't him. That was him. That was him explaining what the thoughts of the average infantry GI was. Mm -hmm Back to the book. Some of our contemporaries had chosen jail or Canada and Sweden. We had chosen Vietnam. At least the anti-war protesters could show the world that we were all not supporting the president's actions, even at war. On the other hand, we had to survive this war. Since the VC and the North Vietnamese had designs for killing us, and we had designs on them, we were both de facto enemies. Nevertheless, most Vietnam GIs and the anti-war protesters back home had something in common. I love this. This right here is awesome. The frontline troops hated the war, and they hated the safer combat support personnel. The combat support personnel hated the war, and they hated the organizational general staff. The staff personnel hated the war, and they hated the troops back in Europe and the troops back home. The troops back home hated the war, and they hated the placid, non-caring American civilians. The American civilians supported the war at the time, and they hated the anti-war protesters. And the anti-war protesters hated the war, and they hated the government. Therefore, the protesters and the soldiers alike, alike had one important thing in common. We both hated the war. 
that's a that's a crazy thing to think about. That whole thing is just yeah. like it's, uh, it's you could you could play those kind of circular games with our political system all day long right now. Oh yeah, ridiculous. This overall feeling perhaps can only be described by a related story. As the American troop withdrawals in Vietnam began, an armored outfit, the 2-1 Cav, pulled into Cameron Bay for its long-awaited departure home. Over four years, the 2-1 Cav had performed a combat and combat support role in and around Phan Rang and Phan Chiet. They had eaten dust and mud, been shot at, mortared, and booby-trapped throughout their tour, and now they were going home. To honor these brave and gallant men, General D of the Cameron Support Command decided to give them a fitting welcome home amid banners, bands, and flags. General D himself was on the reviewing stand. And just as the overly tired men of the 2-1 Cav rumbled by in their tanks and armored personnel carriers, the general proudly saluted them. The first man in the lead tank, not knowing it was a general saluting him or just not caring, returned the general's snappy salute in the only way possible. He gave him the finger. June 6th, 1970, coming home. Coming home, we had to go through American customs, sort of like weary tourists back from a year-long overseas jaunt to the enchanted east. Did we have anything to declare? Not much. Most of our prized PX positions, possessions were shipped home, some having been ripped off by certain civilian stevedores along the coast. So now he is he's home June 7th, 1970, Fort Lewis, Washington. A big monster idiot tube welcomed us back to the world. A third-rate TV comedy in the sweaty lounge with grotesque, absurd commercials screaming and clawing at their dazed viewers with a never-ending by-me fervor. I'm sorry, I said as I turned the monster off. I'm just not ready for all this yet. I know what you mean, another voice said, spending a whole year overseas fighting to defend all this crap. So there you go, the TV, the TV, the monster clawing at its viewers. By me, by me. Yeah. May 5th, 1971, a march in San Francisco. There was a huge anti-war protest march in San Francisco this week. Over 700,000 people walked down Geary Street, and in memory of some friends, we found ourselves in front of a large contingent of old-timers from the Lincoln Brigade and directly behind a large group of businessmen against the war. There were students and veterans, housewives with baby prams, burly stevedores and electricians, grandmothers and grandchildren, policemen and hippies, minorities and majorities, all Americans peacefully asserting their constitutional right of free speech and assembly. After the speeches in Golden Gate Park, one badly crippled veteran in a wheelchair had just enough strength to hurl some hard-won combat medals into the field, a bronze star medal and two purple hearts. Nobody cared about us when they sent us over there, he said. And nobody cares about us now. And that kind of closes out the the portion of the book that I wanted to cover. Although I, I do want to actually finish it with what he finishes or how he finishes the book. And he and he finishes the book. Peter N. Swisher finishes the book with a with a quote from someone else and that's how he finishes the book so I want to read that and it says to close out the book it's called another time another place this morning January 21st another picture of war was the worst I have ever seen It is just east of where the engineers have established a ferry crossing 
across the river at a point where the river first bends toward the road until they were, they were buried there lay what was left of eight or ten British soldiers perhaps one of their mortars was hit as some were burned and there had been a heavy explosion but no shell crater was seen nearby of two men only the lower halves remained another two were each lacking a head and another had a leg off at the hip all had been horribly injured a Christmas card lay on the ground bearing the words in a child's handwriting to the best daddy in the world and those words were written by somebody by the name of Captain George Nash Royal Artillery Italy 1944 and if you put this together Peter N Swisher the N in his name stands for Nash because Captain George Nash was Peter Swisher's biological father who I talked about in the beginning who was killed after the war as he came home from Italy another place another time you know life in in many ways in so many different ways we we are not going to understand it it's incomprehensible I mean when you get this Christmas card laying on the ground amongst these savagely wounded soldiers and its Christmas card says in little kids writing to the best daddy in the world I don't I don't I don't understand that I don't know why that is I don't know why the world can be such a horrific place and how life can be so tragic but that is the way it is in some of the things that happen in the world they just happen and we cannot control them but at the same time there are so many things in the world that we do control and all of us all of us we all can somehow in some way relieve or we can attenuate some of that tragedy we don't need to spurn a lonely blade of grass or dam the oceans roar we don't need to do that We can make someone's life a little bit better. We can make ourselves a little bit better. And in doing so, we can make the world, even just a small part of the world, a little bit better. And Peter Swisher, he actually did survive Vietnam. And he went on to become a lawyer. And then he became a professor of law at the University of Richmond. And he was married for 37 years and raised a daughter. And and he died June 15th. 2016 of a cancer a cancer called multiple myeloma which if you don't know what that is that's one of the forms of cancer that's connected to to agent orange which is the chemical that we used in Vietnam to kill the foliage so the enemy couldn't hide in it And that's the cancer that killed Peter Nash Swisher. 
but but luckily his voice and his memories live on with us through his writing and through his stories and I think through these stories he left the world a little bit of a better place and I think that's all I've got for tonight so echo Maybe you could uh, let me decompress a little bit and maybe tell us how we can help us. Make the world a better place. Make the world a better place. <laughs> that sounds like a big deal. It sounds a like a big deal, deal but yeah. is it really that big of a deal? Well, I'm not talking about you personally. you got to individually go out and change the whole world. Right, in a way that everyone can see right now. I had a conversation with, who was I talking to? Someone was asking me, it might have been Pete. It might have been Pete up at Origin. It might have been Peter Roberts. It might have been him. But somebody was asking me, you know, about, you know, coming up in the SEAL teams and when I decided to become an officer. And I might have said this before on here, I don't know, but, you know, I had a platoon commander that was a prior enlisted guy and he was awesome and we all loved him. And when you're in a SEAL platoon, that's the whole world. Yes, that's the whole world is a seal platoon. That's the whole world and We had this awesome officer and this is the time we had a mutiny and all that And so we got rid of our bad officer and We got this good officer came in and it just made our, our lives awesome. Our lives were awesome hmm. And so I said to myself in the back of my mind subconsciously kind of remotely conscious I don't know, but I realized that this guy made our lives awesome. He made our world awesome and I said to myself somewhere in the back little Barely formed human brain of mine. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, you know what someday This guy has made lo the our lives for us 16 guys in this seal platoon our lives are awesome now mm -hmm. And someday I'm gonna try and make life good for 16 guys in a seal platoon. That was my goal mm. yeah. and For that world so so when I say hey make the world a better place now what can you who can you make the world a better place for because you actually can yep. you actually can well, yeah. Whether it's some kid down the street Whether it's somebody that needs help out there whether it's your own kid How can you make the world a better place because you can't you, What can you do to make it a little bit better? Yep. Starts you know what it starts with making yourself a little bit better get yourself stable. I'll tell you that Yep. It's like the like the oxygen mask that dropped down in the aircraft. You got to get yourself squared away first. Yep. True. Once you got yourself squared away, I had somebody asked me the other day, like, I'm bored. What should I do? And I was like, Oh, if you're bored, that means you got room. You got capacity. Yeah. You can go help people. Mm-hmm. And you know how they say, like, helping <coughs> others is like the ultimate like reward. You know, mm -hmm. how they, people they say that. I think even. Before you square yourself away, you, you, it's harder to make that connection, I think. Yes, because you're still struggling yourself. Yeah. It's kind of like a, when you plant the seed. It's like the seed got to grow into a thing above ground first. Then, yeah. You know, sort of, sort of kind of way. But the more squared away like you get, not only the more capable you are of helping others more effectively, but the more you can make that connection, like, oh, mm. this reward is like way better than when I achieved my thing. Right. You know? Right. That's why a lot of people, like, if they really love what they do, I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people, they love what they do, but they're kind of like out of the, the game, mm -hmm. they, they'll teach others how to do it. Yeah. It's just like a natural progression. That is a natural possession. That's true. Look at jujitsu. Yeah. yeah. You, become a, you become a world champion in jujitsu. That's great. Mm -hmm. But then eventually a lot of those guys become instructors and they have teams and that's what they want to do is spread the word oh yeah and like you you'd see these guys who had like big big time careers and stuff on a high level and they're teaching you see how happy they are teaching others like like babalu i don't seem yeah. like a random example but he popped in my my head because i i've been to his class when he's teaching the kids uh, adults up. everything man i'm like this guy's like really engaged with this you know i i'll tell you right now my last and i knew i was like my last few years in the navy where i was running the training and i was really teaching all the time yeah. like that was so good for me i mean yeah. um it was so gratifying 
Yeah. That's it. Cause I get to see the light. I get to see people yeah. learn. I get to see people. I got to make make the world good for someone. <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. these these three guys that figured something out. It's like, yeah, man, you're you're a leader. Yeah. And that's that's good stuff. So yeah, when I talk about that, sounds so uh, trite. Yep. Make the world a better place. Yeah. So how could I say that better? Hey, man, fix something. Helps just fix something around you. Make yeah. your world a better place. That's what I should say. Make your world. Or yeah. make someone else's world. Just make it a little bit better. Yeah. You and, have that capability, believe it or not. And regardless of that, who that someone is, that someone, that someone is you too, by the way. Actually, you first. Or yeah. it could just be you. Yeah. Because if you make your, it's like if you have a neighborhood, right? And the neighborhood, I don't, yeah. you know how they, you know you how you cut like, your lawn and you clean up your thing and you're, yeah. you, that's squaring away. It's helping everyone. Let's say there's 10 houses in a neighborhood, small neighborhood, whatever, mm-hmm. 10 houses. You cut your lawn, you do your hedges, you paint your house, make sure there's no trash in the mm-hmm. yard or whatever. You've improved that whole neighborhood by one tenth. Mm-hmm. That's you true. alone, yeah. let alone everybody else. Don't even yeah. think about anybody else. <laughs> one tenth. It's a lot. You know what I'm saying? So apply good. that concept. There yeah. you go. That's what you do. Boom. There you go. And I like it. So staying on the path, that is. Help us, help us. That's what I said, actually. Help, help us. Can you tell us how to. Can you help us help, help us. us? Yeah. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yes, be happy to. So, first thing, obviously, we're going to talk about jujitsu. Not obviously, but we're going to talk about jujitsu. Yeah, I think it is actually obvious at this point. Yes. It is. You know how many people tweet me a day or message me that they took their first jujitsu class? How many? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you know how for you people means like three? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> Where you're like, well, people have been asking for whatever. Sure. But sometimes you, that really means three people. No, I'm talking on a daily pe- daily basis. Daily <laughs> basis. Sure. I daily would say, basis. I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe three to five people a day. A day daily. That's a lot. That yeah. is a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe it's over exaggerated in my head though. You know what? I don't think so because every single time I go on Twitter, which is pretty much every day, pretty much, mm-hmm. there's at least one person in, you know, the the alerts, right? Yeah, section yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> that I'm like copied in or whatever. Yeah. And uh it'll say, Got my first jujitsu class or got beat up yeah, in jujitsu class. That's what class. I'm saying. So and then this is every single time. Yep. Like I literally cannot remember. See, so it's a, a lot. People are getting on the jujitsu train. Yeah, for sure. Yes. So let's talk. So it's about kind how. of obvious that we're going to talk about jujitsu a little yeah. bit. I'm, you know what yeah. else is good? Hmm. Very few people say, "I tried jujitsu. I just don't like it." Yeah, it's not for me. That's very. I've actually. I can only think of off the top of my head one individual out of all those people yeah. that like went back and forth with me and it was just like, "Look, I do not like this." Yeah. I think this is the guy that I said, "Look, you need to train until you submit someone." Yeah. 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 Then you can stop. If you can submit someone and you're like, okay, I don't like this. Yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty hard to understand. Then it's truly not then for it's you. It's truly not Straight for you. Up. But if yeah. you actually tap someone out, yeah. then yeah. 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 Then it's not yeah. for you. But I bet you even that person, once they got that arm lock, they yeah, were like, yeah. you know what? <laughs> mm, stick with this a little Maybe bit. Maybe this is for me. Yeah. I would that that my money would be on that scenario. So you felt sure. a little bit of claustrophobia, right? In, in the my past, life, I know mean, you're over it, but oh, in could, could 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 that alone stop someone from wanting to train jujitsu? Because I had one yes. guy in a SEAL platoon with me that he would get so because I trained with everyone, mm-hmm. and when I would train with him, he would get so freaked out, like yeah. he would start like like getting actually mad at me, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> you know that. Yeah. yeah. And of course, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> Pull the Jocko. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. just side control, just, just yeah. smash close as I could. Yeah, squeeze, just smash. <laughs> Try and you know what though? Trying to help us, trying to make his world a better place right, by him getting him over that thing. Exposure yeah, therapy, yeah, exposure situation. Therapy. Yes, though the answer is yes. I think that because claustrophobia is like like for real claustrophobia, not just like oh I'm uncomfortable or whatever, oh, okay. but like if you have a for real claustrophobia and it's a spectrum. I get right. it. Some people have it worse than others. But yeah, if they have it So bad maybe enough, somebody on the hardcore claustrophobia spectrum and then they got introduced to it early on and someone that was like a smasher, right? Yeah. Cuz you wouldn't feel claustro I guess you you wouldn't feel if you were going with someone that's got like an open butterfly slash lasso guard yeah or like you're, well yes you're not so feeling very claustrophobic you might, until so, you just caught in that triangle 
Yeah. Then all of a sudden you're freaking out. But, yeah. but then yeah. you tap and you're right. out. The place where you really feel claustrophobic is cross side or mount. Or mount. Or yeah. So and it's not even necessarily a smasher per se. Because mm. jujitsu, you can be mounted just normal mount. Mm -hmm. Not smashing pressure, whatever. Just normal mm -hmm. mount. Because it's not like it's because claustrophobia is psychological. It's not like a physical oh. thing. Primary. I mean, there's phil f physical elements for sure. Of course, it has to be. But um, if you just feel like you can't get out or you can't breathe or you know it's like that's the feeling mm -hmm. but so like a lot of times even even when i was working through mine mm -hmm. and you'd be like smashing me all hard and be like right you're wasting your energy the smashing doesn't do it when we're rolling and it's quiet especially when you're like oh when i know you're doing it on purpose oh, it helps well, it helps me because it, it, cause it seems like a game like you're just uh, messing with me now so it's like but if it's serious if we're just rolling we're not saying anything and it's like now I'm faced with either staying in this position right now forever because I can't get out. I can't get out of your side control right now. Like mm -hmm. history has proven to me kind of thing <laughs> in my brain. So either I, I, I suck it up indefinitely mm -hmm. or I tap out. Both of those to me are death. Like to tap out because you're tired or claustrophobia, like that's worse than tapping out from a submission. Yeah, so that's why a lot of the times you would claustrophobia me into giving me <laughs> giving you my arm or something like that. And then I'd have to tap. But that's how it went, man. So which is I think you I think you tapped two times from just straight claustrophobia yeah because you didn't freaking take the submission <laughs> i was giving you and, and that's terrible and i remember like i was about to be let down at myself as you were saying all this i was kind of disappointed in myself that i didn't identify that that there was a, a further torture i could have been doing to you but yeah. it looks like sometimes i did figure it out yeah so you know <laughs> you, you did. You, so i remember here i remember one time not to go too deep into this because i want to tell you about, a lot about origin so in the, there's this one time where I forget if I rolled with you like that day or the day before. it was really recently I rolled with you and I was I was feeling claustrophobia and you know I gave you my arm and then you took it and I was like yes like I was happy that yeah. you tapped me out and let me out of there because yeah. it's like it's really bad when you when you feel that so the next day I see you rolling with Dean and Dean gets you in double snow angel Ooh. right and you guys were rolling hard for a mm. long time and i'm like dang these guys are going hard i, I would be and i'm kind of empath not empathizing you know when you put yourself in the other person's situation so i'm like hey thinking to myself man these guys are going hard for a long time i would be gassing right now and then dean was like he he got he was getting kind of getting the better you got mount i was i'd be like i'm, I'm feeling for jocker right now because I've, I've been in that scenario where it's like we're going hard and then i wind up in mount I'd be like, man, I'm feeling like, <gasps> like, bre mm -hmm. like breaths in my, <laughs> just by watching. And then he gets you in double snow angel. I'm like, I, it, I was getting like micro anxiety <laughs> from the double snow angel that Dean was doing on you. Cause that's claustrophobia right there. Oh, yeah. Like this. And I, you can't do it. You can't move. What was my reaction? <laughs> he just powered through it. Bro. <laughs> like you didn't even, I don't think he even tapped you, but he was, he was like that for like a long time. And I was like, I, I was like, this guy's a different, another level of like, savage. And I'm not saying necessarily with the grappling i mean that was sort of like a, just, you know that was a side thing just right. the fact that you can endure what i just witnessed you endure <laughs> compared to my own shit i was like man <laughs> nonetheless the answer so is then what yes. happened the next day what do you mean uh, was there a follow-on where i rolled with you again or is that the story no 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 so you what, what i was comparing it to what was helping me really get into your shoes is because i was remembering it could have been that same day that we rolled and I just gave in to the claustrophobia. Mm. Like it was like I had an issue. I was like in terrible shape. I would go train like twice a week, maybe, you know, mm. and not, it, it was bad. It was just a bad scenario. But nonetheless, yes, the answer is yes. If someone gets into jujitsu and they, um, they have a claustrophobic pre-existing kind of, condition yeah thing and then they get <laughs> in a claustrophobia situation early on, like the it's first good. or second yeah. day or something. Yeah, I could see how they wouldn't want to go back, but I don't know. If but here's the good thing about that: if you do jujitsu and, and reap the payoffs of jujitsu, and then you then you get into claustrophobia situation, you're more uh, worried about like how can I overcome the claustrophobia more so than hey, jujitsu produces too much claustrophobia for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you know the benefits and you feel like the the, yeah. the payoff of the jujitsu way more than yeah. you care about or fear claustrophobia. That's my that's my analysis. Anyway. So speaking of jujitsu, jujitsu, yeah, you're gonna need a gi. So you get an origin gi. That's it, straight up. There it is. I answered your question because plenty of people, plenty of people still ask me what gi to get. Yeah, origin gi. Well, you know why? It's because people start at podcast one. Yeah, yeah, and I dig it. And so they're they well they get then by podcast. You know, I was asking people at at the camp. Mm -hmm. I was asking people what 
broke you like because because people get meaning they're listening to the podcast and they're like well they're talking about right, jiu-jitsu right. and then oh well they're talking about it but then they'll be like yeah, yeah, you, you, when you were talking on podcast 23 you were yeah. like there's nothing else like it and I was like okay yeah, I gotta try this so yeah, there's yeah. certain podcasts that people go all right screw it I'm just gonna do this yeah huh. and I think you posted something on social media the other day that said that you're if you're a white belt you already have achieved more than 99% of people in the world yeah because how many people actually less than 1% of the people in the world do jujitsu for sure yeah for yeah. sure yeah fully and um uh, yeah I reposted I retweeted it from Joey Sylvester uh, he and I think he even retweeted it from somebody because so true mm-hmm. like and I, the reason I reposted it is of course for new new people you know coming in but that's a good reminder it was a good reminder for me for every because I think it's a good reminder for, for everybody because you know that feeling like you know when people are like man I, I hey, for everybody in everything not just jujitsu yeah because there's other stuff that you should be doing that you might not be doing yeah because you're like oh well I don't want to cross the line or I don't want to take the first step yeah you know take don't want to take step. the first step taking the yeah. first step is always big yeah I wrote about that but even like taking so yeah again there's two two elements to that taking the first step meaning if you're not in jujitsu and you take that first step to go to jujitsu right there's that and then to me it was like when you get your ass kicked you know like mm-hmm. even even you how you say like sometimes i'll just get my ass kicked some days sure. like and people no matter what level they are they'll be like oh man you know they'll say oh man i got my ass kicked but i'm ready you know and i'm coming back and i liked it and all this stuff and then and then they'll ask when when do when do i not feel so awkward or when do i not feel yeah. like i don't know what i'm doing i'm like well you <laughs> it all you always feel like that you just feel like that a little bit less yeah. every every year or whatever yeah. um and so and sometimes you can be at a high level and feel like that more often than not still you know because it just did depends on training partners all that stuff so that i thought that that was a really good reminder is like being there is like super important yeah and it's like really be- beneficial it is and also is the to take the first step if you're out there let this be the podcast number 143 that you said you know what man i've heard enough talk about this i'm gonna go get some yeah today's the day today's the day there's plenty of jujitsu schools out there yeah and most of them are good you know which one makes or not which one but when this is what makes me like want to just go train right now is anytime you go into one of your spiels about how it's a superpower <laughs> it's absolutely true that's why yeah i was telling Cole like when we were, we were waiting earlier today my cousin Cole, mm-hmm. he um how when you start jujitsu like you could do jujitsu for one year and right then at that point, you can you can beat up everyone else who doesn't play doesn't do jujitsu. Yep. Like in a just in, in a general way, in of a general speaking, way. Yes. you know, like that. You go, roughly speaking, yeah, roughly speaking, <laughs> there are, there are exceptions for sure. Yeah. But you know, like there's not many things in the world that are like that are like that. You know? Yeah. No, it's it's a superpower. Yeah. So if, every time I listen to you say that kind of thing and do your little explanation, um, that's like. True, because it kind of re- puts it into yeah. When people bring yeah. their kids in here, I tell them. I was telling this family this the other day. I said, I said, I, I truly believe that jujitsu is the best thing you can give your kid, including love. <laughs> 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 I said, Better than love, figure huh? that part out. <laughs> I go about the jujitsu. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's very important. All right. So you can get your geese from yeah. OriginMain.com. OriginMain.com made in Maine. That's why it's OriginMain.com, and they're made there, and they're made specifically for jujitsu. Yep. The weave is for jujitsu. The fabric is for jujitsu. The cut is for jujitsu. Yep. Made by people that do jujitsu, by black belts in jujitsu, yep. designed by people that train. Yeah. People that are black belts. Dedeco. Yep. Peter Roberts. Yep. In there with. Scissors, cutting geese. <laughs> yeah, sure, scissors. I don't well, know. now it's I've, lasers. Yeah, I haven't really seen any scissors, but you know, I've seen those little what do you call them, the little saw things. Yeah, you yeah. know. They, no, but when you make the original patterns, you got to use scissors, bruh. Bruh, I don't know that kind of. Yeah. I don't do that kind of stuff. Well, sure. hey, I know now though. I know now, and that's good. So yeah, scissors, uh, saw, all that stuff, all made in America. If you're training no gi, rash you can get the rash guards. Rash guards, hundred percent. And they're also made here in America, in America, which is a big deal. And if you're doing other exercise outside of jujitsu, got joggers if you're jogging, or if you're just cruising, whatever, <laughs> and hoodies, and you know shirts and whatnot, apparel, apparel, 
originmain.com. All made in America, by the way. Also supplements, Jocko supplements. Yeah, Joint Warfare. Now, people have been asking me Joint Warfare or Krill Oil. Yeah. Good Which question, one? by the way. It's a good question. Um, I think Brian, I asked him the same question because I have a hard time answering it. The reason I have a hard time answering it is because I do both all the time and I'm not stopping any one of them as an experiment. I'm not doing that. It's right. not worth it. It's no, not worth yeah, it to me. Yeah, there's no logical reason. There's no logical reason for it. But what he said, and I kind of agree with this, uh, it makes sense. If you are doing preventative krill oil, mm-hmm. if you're doing heal joint warfare. Yeah. Good way to put it. I, I, you know, my recommendation kind of is like do both. Yeah. Take be, them both. Yeah. But um, that sounds like a good idea. So if you have, if your joints are like just started bothering you or, or you got the elbows bothering you or your shoulders bothering you, I think shoulders for me is the one that I always notice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then if it's hurt, get on, get on some joint warfare. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good. And I say both because it's th- the way I would see it and put it in. This is just kind of the way I see it, where it's like a 80-20. You know, it's not like, oh, joint warfare is 100% for healing up and recovering your joints. And then, I you actually know, it's like don't a, think that at all, but yeah, I just, and the other thing, oh, well, I don't know. Yeah. That's well, what my Brian 80, said. I'm putting it out there. I'm yeah. not, I would, yeah, I, I, I obviously recommend both, but you know, sometimes that costs a lot of money. And some, yeah. some people are like, you know what? I can only afford one. Cool. Yeah, I dig take, it. Take krill oil because that's all encompassing health. Right. Yeah. Whereas joints, like yeah, when your joints start getting jacked up a little bit, yeah. Which, Game by the way, nuts. if you're doing jujitsu, you're gonna feel it. You're yeah. gonna feel jujitsu. Feel jujitsu is not a sport that you don't feel. Yeah. <laughs> you, you you will feel, you feel it. Feel. Yeah. You feel it. Yeah, it's true. But they're both good, hundred percent. And then you got um, Mulk. 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 So drink. I'm 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 envisioning a world one day because I was in a traveling yesterday. Horrible, and. Man, I got like a chocolate milk, like a regular chocolate milk, mm-hmm. which is just awful crap. Well, and it doesn't even taste as good. No, it doesn't taste as good. You got used to the milk, that's what it was. But still, objectively, it does not taste as good. And it's unhealthy. Yeah. So one day, one day mm-hmm. in this world, you'll be able to go to the little shop in the airport, the the seven eleven, and you'll just be able to walk in, they'll have a little counter for milk. They'll have a little mulk situation going on. They will, because how can they not do that? I mean, eventually, (laughs) right? No, I mean, eventually you fast forward. I don't know if it's going to take two years or four years, but eventually, so many people are going to demand it. Yep. There's going to be oh yeah. There's going to be mulk restaurants. There's just going to be different flavors. (laughs) You're just going to go in there, like little mulk bars. The little mulk bars, but they won't even have food. They'll just have mulk. Just have mulk. Yeah, you know how they have tequila bars, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Same Same thing, thing, but but mulk, but different. Mulk on tap. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, you know, I have that dream too. You know, and um, until then, yeah, you can get it at originmate.com. <laughs> uh, also, discipline too. If you want to get your mind right, you know that expression, oh, get your mind yeah, right. Yeah. Not to say your mind's not right. I'm saying no, get it, give it even the more most right. fired up I've ever heard a guy tell me about getting his mind right. I was up at Yosemite, <laughs> and this guy, I was coming out from a hike, from a pretty good hike, a couple days out in the bush. <laughs> And there was a guy, and he was he was in the middle of the river, like sitting on yeah. a rock, just a calm oh, river, not like sure. you know he's sitting on a rock. And we stopped there. I think we jumped in, and you know he saw me, and he was all he, immediately. You know I could tell he was in the game. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he comes over, and he was like, "I said, hey man, you know." He said, "Oh man, I listened to your podcast, bro. We were listening to all the way." He was with one of his movies. We were listening to it all the way up here. We just drove six hours to get up here. We just listened to whatever it was. Uh, 48 and 49 mm. back to back <laughs> and yeah, I was yeah. like I was like oh man that's awesome he's like what are you doing up here are you climbing you guys gonna go hiking he goes no man I just came up here to get my mind right and I was like yeah <laughs> I don't even know what that means get it, get it, it, get get it. Right. well I guess I do know what it means yeah mm. I kind of yeah go up there get your mind right yeah dig it and so, if you want supplementation for doing that <laughs> discipline boom pre-mission mind your mind literally will get will your get mind right. right yeah Mission get your uh, that's a positive brain, thing, right? yeah. That's so, that's the origin main.com, yeah. That's where you get it. Also, if you want to support yourself, you want to represent Jocko as a store, it's called Jocko Store. So you go to jockostore.com, it's mm-hmm. where so you can represent huge time, <laughs> huge time represent. A lot of people representing, <laughs> and this is one of those things. So basically, you this is where you can get your shirts and, and hoodies and hats, rash guards, yeah, 
Trucker hats, by the way. Trucker hats. You don't have to get the flex fit you don't if, have if to. you don't want to. Nope, if you don't if want you, to, you, you don't have to. If you prefer keeping it old school like we used to do it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. I'm tra- I've, I think I've worn trucker hats before on a regular uh, basis. I never saw Not you much. with a hat until like three minutes ago when you put one on momentarily and <laughs> yeah. I looked up and I just got disturbed. Yeah, well, it's been literally like like 15 years before I, uh, since I've... And your head doesn't get a beat down by the sun? Well, I'm very brown. Yeah. And I'm from Kauai, so I'm, yeah. I think I'm used to that one. Yeah. But actually, no, to answer your question, yeah, sometimes if I hang in the sun for a long time, Then sure. you want a hat. You don't put one on. Maybe. Straw hat? Sometimes. <laughs> coconut coconut leaf hat? Oh, yeah. yeah sometimes. That's what we used to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Nonetheless, when you're representing Jocko shirts, when I see people representing in the wild, yeah. who made that up in the wild? Was that you who said that? or someone? I think, I think I, someone else said that. I, I don't know, but I definitely... I think I might have said it because I think the first no I did say it because I remember I hadn't seen one in the wild right trooper and that's in the something wild. yeah I'd be like I never saw a trooper in the wild and then eventually I did and now man I was in the airport yesterday I saw like seven people they weren't wearing shirts but yeah. they were all coming up and being like hey what's up so yeah. p- people were fired up in the wild yeah but yeah good go there get something uh, you know if you want to represent and represent in the wild boom mm-hmm. discipline equals freedom Anyway, yeah, JockoStore.com. made a new Discipline Equals Freedom shirt. Yes. It's it's a little bit cooler, it's, in my opinion. Well, you know, it's one of and these deals. that might be biased because I sort of... <laughs> you had I, some influence. I influenced that one. On that one. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. You're you a good were, designer. You, when you, when I told you, hey, make equals smaller, yeah. and I could see in your mind you were thinking is off balance, off balance. Physically. Yeah, Physically, the, the, letters... Yeah. Yeah. And then I gave you the idea of, hey, no, you put two lines. It's an equal sign. Awesome. There's layers, and you're la- you got all ex- it was like a done deal in your mind. Yeah. It, it, Nirvana had been achieved with yeah. the new T-shirt, well, the new did, Def T-shirt. It, it did click because, and I saw why you wanted the equals small. Yeah, because that's not it. the main thing. Like, yeah, discipline is it. That's the main thing. Yeah. Discipline. Yeah. Nonetheless, anyway, jockostore.com if you want to represent. Freedom's the main thing, too. Represent, yeah, not the equals. Well, equals is, it's it's all equal. How about yeah, that? Yeah, but it's not the main thing. Yeah. All right, there you go. So, Jocko solved that problem. Not that it was a problem, but, you know, he, he, he influenced with his improvement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody go. out there is like, no, I like the equals being bigger. Yeah. Echo shirt was better. Equality, boom. Yeah, and they're see, into equality. Like they like the discipline. They like the freedom. They like the freedom just as much as the discipline. Yeah, and for vice them, versa. Equality was kind of the deal. That's the deal, and I dig it. They're gonna have to keep their old school shirt. Yeah, <laughs> dig it. Represent. Get another way. Yeah, whatever, man. All yeah. good. All good. Also, good way to stay on the path. The current path is to subscribe to this podcast if you have not already. That includes YouTube, so that's the video version. So yeah, if you're on the podcast platforms, apps, whatever, wherever you listen to your podcast, man, subscribe, leave a review if you feel like it. And also don't forget about the Warrior Kid podcast, which we just released 17 and 18, 18. all at the same time. And I apologize that those uh, took a little while to get out. And my, when I came down from my garage gym this morning, got done with the work, get some. Bro, I squatted today. And I haven't been able to squat. Heavy? I, not, not like, no, not heavy. It's, actually, but some. straight up, yeah. not heavy because I have, I had back to back, tweak knee, or well, tweak back and then tweak knee. So I, I just haven't been able to. G- g- <laughs> and today, I just went, oh, man, I couldn't believe squatting is hard. Yes. Like if you're not used to it, which I'm not right now. Yeah. And I, and believe me, during the even when my back was tweaked and my knee was tweaked I'm still doing pistols I'm still doing box jumps I'm still doing burpees and lunges and even little kettlebell like type little you know movements so it's not like my legs are just sitting there atrophying on a couch right no they're still in the game <laughs> over here <laughs> but man then I just racked up I was, you, you asked me what heavy no I did 225 I did yeah. like a few sets of 225 and I was like and I was doing some stuff in between but still yeah. Yeah. I couldn't believe I, I yeah. So my point is, if you can squat, squat. Yeah. If you can squat, get squat. Get get it on, because yeah. that just makes you stronger, yeah. tougher, 
You do have that. It might even make though. you smarter, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. No, I read actually. Now I think about it. I read something about the the, the neurotropic release that happens when you squat. Your yep. whole body gets better. Well, it, that's exercise in general. Resistance exercise in general. Actually, a lot of kind of exercise in general. Yeah, it's but kind when of you're a, squatting, you're using like a yeah, lot of. It does more. It's yeah. true. It ups your testosterone too. There you go. Because and here's why basically because it's a huge muscle group that's yeah. why oh yeah so yeah. and it's not just one muscle group because when you're squatting you're actually using I think when you're squatting you're using so many muscles bunch yeah, yeah. Makes all sense. kinds of core stabilizers <laughs> and, and stuff that's like not that. to mention you, the biggest muscles in your body and with basically all your big muscles yeah. all of them not yeah. just one big yeah. one and then a bunch of small ones like you know most of your body that's kind of how it is you know you're, yeah. you're using your your shoulders and then your triceps and a little bit of your but chest I went to this hotel thing. the other day and they had hundos dumbbells Hun- oh, yeah I was pretty that's stoked yeah, yeah that's in the yeah. game I was like oh, okay all right respect. here we go yeah get some everyone should have if you're if you have a hotel if you're a hotel owner get some hundos in there yeah. get some hundos you don't so. even have to get you can get because normally they stop at 50s. If you get, let's just say 50s, if you just get a set of 70s and yep. a set of hundos, we'll be good. Yeah. We'll be good worldwide. Yeah, I The think whole so. world will be happy. Yeah. You'll be especially happy because I know you like them dumbbells. You were saying, dumbbells. you we were all fired up the other day talking about dumbbells. Yeah. <laughs> I do like dumbbells. Well, it, because it's a fun exercise. There's more to it than just getting under the bench, for example, and pushing the bench. Yeah. You know, it's. I mean, there's more, a little bit more to bench than that when you get into it. But dumbbells, is like you got to okay, you got to pick those guys up one in each hand. And then you got to balance them on your knees, and then you got to get them up there into position. It's like a whole that thing. right there is a whole thing, exactly yeah. right. And that's not to mention the strength you got to have to push them. Mm-hmm. So you know, when you get kind of good at them and you do them a lot, it it does become kind of fun. Jack, there good. you go. Boom. Nonetheless, I don't know how we started talking about dumbbells. <laughs> well, Jocko was squatting, his legs are sore, all this stuff. And then Oh yeah, and then Warrior Kid Podcast. How did that lead to it? I don't know. But you know, every that's how you oh, are. Oh, because when I came home Oh yeah, because oh this is what I was gonna say. My wife was listening to the Warrior Kid Podcast yes. this morning when I came down from the from the gym. Mm-hmm. And she was all smiles. Yeah. And she's like, Oh, this story is very good, darling. Does I tell the little <laughs> Uncle Jake story? Sure. You know? Yeah. And she starts naming the people. She's like, oh, is this this person? Because the stories that Uncle Jake tells, there's they're not they're not uh, what's they're not nonfiction stories, right? Like, yeah. but there's the basis. I, the story inspired comes inspired by a true yes. story. Kind yeah, of. that's what is it based on a true story? Well, there's based and then there's inspired by yeah, true events. That's pro- like a they're different probably, level. They're prob- well, which one is the less true? Inspired by true yeah, events. Yeah, so I think they're inspired by. Yeah. Inspired yeah. by true events, but I they're not. They're that. not based on. Yeah. Although the one that just came out, me being out in a rowboat in the middle of a lake and yeah. the oars fall through the oarlocks, yeah. that happened. That's true. And guess what? I had no life jacket. <laughs> Is that smart? No. Some no. kids got to learn about that. Got to learn about. Be it. prepared. Yeah. Be prepared. Don't don't take little shortcuts. Agree. Anyways, that's a Warrior Kid podcast. Good. You can you can listen to those. And you talked about YouTube. Yeah. If you're on the YouTube channel, Echo has put puts out. He puts out videos, and they're. Enhanced, we'll say. Yeah, they're enhanced. Also, just a regular video version of the podcast and little excerpts that are not enhanced. They're just chopped up yeah. for consumption. I think we should have more of those too, by the way. Yeah, I, I put one up today. I'll put more. We'll do that every day, I think. Dang. You know, that'd be good, right? Appropriate. We'll say appropriate. Yeah, you might have to edit them more. The one I think, the one, it was the one you put up today like 10 minutes or 11 minutes long. I forget. Too long. It was how to stay in shape when you travel. Yeah, so it should be like this. How to stay in shape when you travel. Do burpees in your hotel room. Get some. (laughs) (laughs) No, I think people need more information Uh, on that one. Also, hey, Warrior Kids, speaking of Warrior Kids, get the uh, go to irishoaksranch.com. We got young Aiden, the Warrior Kid, and he's making soap. He's got his own business. He's got his own business. I think he just turned 13, what, a couple months ago. And he's got his own business. He's got income. He's got expenses. He's got produ- production. He's got a production line. And that really, how legit is that? Very legit. And it's not like, hey, I dig it, man. When you sell lemonade, we used to sell bananas when I was little. We we go yeah. in the backyard, oh, yeah. pick no some lie. bananas. That's what we did. Yeah, yeah. And we go on the side of the road. We stop every car. It's a yeah. small road. It's not the freeway or mm-hmm. nothing. We stop every car. We say, hey, we got bananas. One dollar yeah. for one banana, which I know is kind of expensive, but one dollar for one banana, or five dollars for a banana, a bag of bananas. Mm-hmm. For I think there's like I don't know eight or ten bananas in there, so you know the whole deal thing. Yep. We make some money. I dig it, but let's face it, 
you can get bananas literally on the side of the road in Hawaii. <laughs> so they're like, all right, we'll buy them. Yeah, you they're know? just being cool. Yeah, they're being cool. But yeah, my, over my here, little daughter, she'd be out in front of my house selling a piece of rock, selling whatever. Yeah, you know, she'd you know? just selling all kinds of people buy it. Yeah. She's cute. Yeah. She's cute. And they right. go, oh, yeah, here you go. Good she mark. says, would you like to buy a rock? <laughs> Sure. Where to come from? Over there in the dirt. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, we'll give you three dollars for it, yeah. young lady. Thank you. Exactly. So that's what you pulled with the bananas. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. I mean, maybe a little bit more value than a rock, but it's still yes, yeah, same nice deal. Rocks, bro. But <laughs> <laughs> you go over here, Irish Oaks Ranch. This soap is like legit soap. Oh yeah, yeah, for like sure. It's, it's not like a novelty soap no. for looks. It's like for real soap that you use. Yeah. It's legit. Yeah. Soap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's a kid making it. Yeah, that's that's the impressive part. These, overall and he's making it from goat milk so it's yeah. not like he's making he's pouring like some he's milking a goat right he's not, milking his goats God, to get yes. the milk to make yeah. the soap this yeah. is a whole thing yeah it's not like it's he's going process. on the internet to the make a soap.com and then they, and pour, going, they, they send you the ingredients and then you pour them into a thing and you got yeah. soap no, no he's milking a goat by the way he's no. raising the goat <laughs> the right. goat does the, the goat doesn't deep. the goat doesn't just like it's not alive. It's not a mechanical goat. It's a living goat that has made in to America. be kept alive. Made in America, too. Yeah, absolutely made in America. So, yeah. It goes deep, man. Our yeah. show is ranch.com. <laughs> Get some. Stay clean. You also All got that. psychological warfare. If you need a little little get some, yeah. you can throw that. Well, you get it for your alarm clock. If you need it for your alarm clock, if you, need, if you have a little trouble getting up out of the bed in the morning, use it for your alarm clock. But give your significant other most likely your wife, give her a heads up that there's going to be a random dude in the bedroom in the morning talking to you. Yeah. So it doesn't surprise her and scare her and make her hate you. Yeah. That's Psychological Warfare, iTunes, Google Play. And we're coming out with a second one. We're gonna try, I'm going to try and get that done by Christmas. Can we get it done by Christmas, you think? I think so, yeah. Okay, cool. We're go. doing shopping. Shopping. Compulsive shopping. Somebody wants smoking. smoking. How many people? We can do it. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, smoking. I'll try smoke. I'll think about smoking. Yeah. I don't, I've never smoked. So it's a little hard for me to relate to. Right, right. But I may do just a straight up addiction. Addiction, yeah. What are you addicted to? Because everybody's addicted to something. Yeah. You know, some people are addicted to cocaine. Some people are addicted to alcohol. Some people are addicted to sugar. Some people are addicted to uh, drama. That's what I was going to say, right? actually. Drama, yeah. Yeah, people are addicted to drama. Yeah. So maybe we'll do one about that. But yeah, that's psychological warfare, and you can get it on iTunes and on. Google Play and all that stuff. What is psychological warfare? No, I know everybody knows. All right, well, if you, if you hit a moment of weakness, boom, listen to psychological warfare and get you past it. That's what it is. Boom. Also, speaking of weakness and your workouts, workout weakness, real weakness, physical weakness, whatever. Um, anyway, you get a plateau in your workout, get some new equipment. That's what I did. I got rings. Get it from on it, on it com slash Jocko. I got rings and kettlebells. Actually, that was a long time ago. I got the kettlebells, but I'm glad I did. Um, again, the rings, battle ropes, like stuff you can vary it, vary it up and create little challenges for yourself within the workout. I know that's what kind of what a workout is, but you know when it gets mundane. No. You see what I'm saying? You just <laughs> no. BTF through Actually, it. I think you do know when it gets mundane because for you, it is mundane. You just, I think that's part of your challenge. I think that's your just challenge. Yeah, yeah. You exercise No, I that. mix up my workouts a lot more than you think I do. Yeah. You know, I, sometimes I do squats. And then sometimes I do front squats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. You heard it here first, folks. Anyway, uh, like I said, on it.com slash Jocko. And then you get some tea. A lot of people have been asking where to get the cans, the ready to drink. RTD, that's a thing that you start learning when you like get into this kind of thing. What? The, like the, the industry? Yeah. Uh, the industry, terminology. Yeah, yeah, is yeah. RTD, ready to drink. Yeah, yeah. So if you want Jocko white tea in a can... This is another thing. One day in the world, it's going to be like, hey, I'm driving out a long drive. I'm going to stop at this 7-Eleven here. Hmm. I'm going to go in there and they're going to have a job. Instead of having to get a horrible, chemical-filled, crappy, sugar, psycho drink, yep. I'm going to get something that is literally good for me. Yep. Jocko White Tea. Huh. And then that's what's going to happen. But until then, it's on Amazon. It's on Amazon Prime. Why is that? Because freaking it weighs a lot. Mm -hmm. So to save money for you on the shipping, you can get the Amazon Prime and it just comes to your house and it's awesome. And the obvious benefit and everyone you know knows already is that once you drink Jocko White Tea, you can deadlift a minimum of 8,000 pounds, including Jordan Peterson, who yep. 
overcame his plateau of 7,000 pounds. <laughs> yep, that's good. Got himself right up there to 8,000 pounds. Got some books, too. Yeah, books. Way of the Warrior Kid. Okay, Mark's Mission. Mark's Mission is the second one. Yes, so it Way is. of the Warrior Kid and then Way of the Warrior Kid. Mark's Mission. I told you I read this to my daughter every night, right? Yes. Now, well, every here's the thing. When I said I read, read it every night, it's like pretty much every night. Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? We do other quizzes and stuff, so sometimes. Mm-hmm. But now she's in kindergarten now, and now there's a thing where they require. Um, they don't require, but yeah, the, well, you know they reading. recommend. Yeah, yep. uh, per night. Mm-hmm. So I did, I just do one chapter a night. Boom, boom, boom. And she got so into. She's into this second one a lot, a lot mm-hmm. more. Because I mean, not that she wasn't. Because the first one is kind of the ethos now. Because I read yeah. it more than once to her, so maybe that has a lot to do when's, with it. Because it's yeah, new. You might go back. Yeah, she's into the new one because it's new. Yeah. At some point, you're gonna go back to the original one, and she's gonna f- start. Maybe even like me when I read, like I was reading about face the other night for the forty seven thousandth time, sure. and you're like, you just get more stuff out of it. Yeah, that, and I that think is true. those books, those warrior kid books. That's what's gonna happen. Like yeah. when she turns six, she's gonna read it again. When she turns seven, she's gonna go like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna get discipline equals freedom." Yeah, like she doesn't yeah, know yeah. what that means right now. Right. Yeah. But when she's, she's eight, she's gonna figure that out. Yeah. Nathan James. Right? Yeah. This makes it extra funny because I know who Nathan James is. Oh, you know what I'm whoa. saying? Like I know the thing. So that makes, <laughs> oh, it's, it makes it extra funny where she really like anytime he comes up because you know how like kind of each chapter goes back and forth. One is like him at camp and yeah. what happened. Then the other one is like him starting business and went yeah. back to camp yeah. and doing this. So it's like that, right? Yeah. So every time we go back to Nathan James, she perks up like, what's yeah. up with you? So we're at the part where, uh, you know how um, th- he's doing recon, right? Finding oh, out. Oh, yeah. Finding and, out about Nathan James. Yeah. And she's finding out that part, and then like she's really because we tell her that we, we used to tell her that all the time. Not everybody has a TV in their room. Not everybody has like all this X Y Z good stuff or mm-hmm. whatever. So she really like it. It was like she was familiar with the concept, so she really just attached to it. Yeah. But yeah, for some reason I don't know because I make my voice like how you make your voice all when I make Nathan James voice. I think well, that's part of it too. Do I do Nathan James in the audio? No, but no, no, no. I, no, no. When you, you know how you make your voice when you oh. imitate somebody, oh, okay. some dork or okay. whatever. You know, you're. But Nathan <laughs> James isn't a dork. No, I know, but I make my voice like oh, okay. Nathan James because I try to make him sound annoying because he's annoying. Oh God! See what I'm it. saying? Okay. But yeah. Anyway, it's very dope way the word. Love the real Both Nathan James on the podcast. I know, bro. Can't wait. Yeah. Fired up. Yep. He was down here, but. Um, I was like, hey, are we going to do this? And he was just busy. And he goes, let's wait until I get this thing taken care of, and then we'll do it. And I said, cool. Yeah. So we're going to do it. Yeah, yeah. The real Nathan James. Also, discipline equals freedom. Field manual. Best kind of manual there is, by the way. A field manual. That's my opinion. This is how to, you know how you have a basic structure slash backbone and just how to be. You know what? You know what word you're looking for? Operating system. Operating system. There yes. you go. Yep. There's that's your perfect, operating system. Perfect word, actually. Um, that's your. Uh, so it's like, boom, you read it. Cool. I got a general thing, but you can kind of have it to refer to every once in yeah. a while. It's pretty cool to get feedback on that book. Yeah. And have people that get completely on the path from that book. And then more important, they stay on the path from that book. Is it possible that a book has that much of an impact? The answer is yes. Yeah. And it seems weird to say that. I mean, it does. Mm-hmm. It seems weird for me to say that, but there's that is 100% true. Yeah. It's 100% true. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I mean, do you do you read it? Yeah. I mean, I know you. Yeah. yeah so, so, I mean, so I was going to say it may not make sense for you, but it will make perfect sense to you where, you know, like there's a lot of good books out there. You told like good books and they're, you know, but you read them and they're kind of long and they have the, you know, they're real laid out very well. And there's like, they go into detail, which is good. That's kind of what a good book kind of does. Right. This one kind of violates that rule in a way because it's super basic. Mm -hmm. But that's why, in my opinion, like when I go back to it, I can just go back to it and boom, it's all like in there. I don't have to read like 10 or 20 or 30 pages. There's nothing to decipher. Yeah. You know, so it's like fundamental principles are just raw in your face. Yeah. Good reminder. Big and time. then you got extreme ownership for combat leadership principles that you can use in your business and life, written by me and my brother Leif Babin. And we have a follow up to that book coming out. It's called The Dichotomy of Leadership. You need to, if you want to get first edition, which, which you do, hey, somebody at camp gave me a first edition of Ernie Pyle's book, Brave Men first edition 
Uh, yeah, how awesome is that? So that feeling, that 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 feeling right there of like I got the first edition of this book. Yeah. Brave men. That's the one where he's talking about the, the rumbling coming and the noise is building and he doesn't know what it is and he looks up in the sky and he's like, "It was the heavies." Yeah. Probably one of my favorite quotes. Yeah. And I have the first edition <laughs> of that book now. Legit. So, dichotomy of leadership. Of course, what's the publisher doing? Cutting corners. Hey, we can get away. Oh yeah, the they're being conservative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, that's they're going to do that. Yeah, they're going to do that because it's... that's just what they do. That's that's what their their gamble is. They they make their little predictions, and that's what they get. That's what they're doing. They'd rather they'd rather they'd rather actually underestimate and have, have a little demand for the book and have yeah. a little spike and a little buzz about that. So they they would rather there be less first edition, or right. r- rather have more people walking around with the fourth edition. Right, that's right. all lame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, yeah, dichotomy leadership coming out September twenty fifth. If you want to get on that thing, you can pre order it wherever you pre order books. You can pre order it, and then got a leadership consulting company called Echelon Front, where we solve problems through leadership. What kind of problems? All of them. Because every problem that you have inside your organization is a leadership problem. I'm here to tell you straight up factually. Mm -hmm. No matter what the problem is, it's a leadership problem. And I know that might hurt. Because guess who the leader is? You're the leader. Mm. Or your subordinate leaders. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. You need to get them on board with the program. You're not making the, 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 the bottom line. Guess what? Guess what kind of problem that is? It's not a money problem. It's a leadership problem. Production's not meeting... It's quota. Yeah. Is that a production problem? It's a leadership problem. Yeah. So no matter what problems you're having in your organization, they get solved through leadership. It's me, it's Leif, it's JP, Dave, Flynn, and Mike. And if you want us to come and work with your company, don't call a speaking agency. Just go to echelonfront.com and we will show up and crush. <laughs> Um, Muster 006 <laughs> might be sold out by the time this gets released, but if you want to come, we talk leadership intensely and granularly for two days. It's in San Francisco, October 17th and 18th. You can register for that at extremeownership.com. Same with the roll call. Yeah, I think we're done let talking me ask, about the roll call. Let me ask you the this. The roll call is, when this podcast comes out, I don't think there'll be any more seats. So apologies. For the muster and the roll, well, this is the first roll call, so I don't know. But for the muster, what percentage of, let's say your typical group of people that come or whatever, mm-hmm. what's the percentage of appeal-wise? What's the percentage of just, so there's information, perfect, you know, good guidance, mm-hmm. and then there's just to hang. Like let's you know like well to, I mean, like if you, you look at the days the days we go from eight in the morning until four o'clock in the afternoon and on the first day yeah. and and then the second day we go eight in the morning until three o'clock in the afternoon or maybe two thirty yeah. and to answer your question we start we we muster with everyone at four forty five in the morning. So we that whole time the eat and then when we get done at five we hang out until nine or ten that night. Mm-hmm. And then the next day, same thing, four forty five in the morning and then we go to jujitsu at night. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, I mean we're there the whole time. Yeah. You will one hundred percent hang out. Yeah, that's with, what I mean. With all of us. Like you're like so yeah. that's, if that's your question. Yeah. The percentage of you hanging out and is one hundred percent. Yeah, that's part of the appeal, right? Because how you say, yeah, we muster at four forty-five, but you, one could think from the outside, hey, that's a workout. But here's the thing: yeah, it's a workout, but it's kind of fun, you know. Yeah, JP's yeah. talking trash, <laughs> and you know, afterwards we kind of, you know, and it's kind of a hang until it starts at eight, and then beat, you know, the 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 breaks that you take or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh yeah, you're kind of well, hanging. Everyone else takes a break. Yeah, you guys. Are... We don't take breaks. No, we just answer questions. We talk to people we take pictures sign books whatever yeah, yeah. the whole and, time and that kind of happens throughout the whole time and then after it's sort of wraps it's I like painted oh, myself into i painted the whole team into a corner yep. room we <laughs> totally did because <laughs> totally in the beginning did. i was like look there's not going to be any green room we're yeah. not going backstage yeah. we're going to be out there the whole time so guess yeah. what we do there's no green room there's no backstage <laughs> we're out there the whole time yeah. it's like two 
20 hour days is what it is yeah because four hours we get some sleep you're like yeah oh yeah you don't want a green room okay now you can't have a green yeah room. exactly that's Otherwise how it goes down um on top of that like i said roll call we're pretty much done with number one you can check and see if there's any openings but it's probably not looking great right now maybe we can open up a couple more seats anyways for that as well register at extremeownership.com and now we of course we have ef overwatch we're connecting spec ops and combat aviation leaders to companies that need leaders people are asking um you know what what about guys from conventional forces which the reason we started with combat aviation and spec ops because that's where we came from and so that's where we have community ties now that we actually have we actually have some people coming on the team right now from conventional forces that we work with alongside awesome leaders and so we're looking at how we're going to open this up to the rest of the military and get everyone else engaged because guess what we work the civilian sector all the time i just said problems get solved by leadership S- civilian companies guess what they need they need leaders and the military has them so that's what we're working if you want to enroll in that from either side from either a person that wants a job or a person that's looking for leaders go to efoverwatch.com and until we do see you at one of these events or see you in the airport or see you on the jiu-jitsu mat or see you wherever if you want to interact or give us answers or give us questions you can do that on the interwebs we are on twitter we're on the instagram and we're also on facebook (laughs) people echo is at echo charles and i am at jocko willink and finally to those of you who like Peter Nash Swisher who served in the military or you are serving in the military at this time thank you for your service and for those that protect us here at home and the police and law enforcement and correctional officers and firefighters and border patrol and paramedics and all other first responders thank you for what you do day in and day out and to everyone else making your way through the world working and grinding and building and creating that's awesome and keep doing those things and do those things with some intent some good intent the intent to make yourself better and when you've got yourself on a good path then show someone else the path help them off that slippery slope help them because in another time in another place it could be you that needs help so take the world or that little part of the world that you can take it into your trembling hand and help help yourself become better help others become better and in doing so help this strange and often hostile world that we live in make it just a little bit better by getting out there and getting after it and until next time this is echo and jocko out